So w welcome uh, everybody to the Partnering for Growth uh, and uh, Value Adding in Food and Beverage Supply Change. This event is brought to you by the Food Industry Innovation Project of the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. Uh, great to have uh, this event here at the Shelter Brewing Company which is such a great venue for Bustleton and uh, it really shows you the sorts of things that's happening in food and beverage manufacturing in the region. My name's John Berry, I'm a project manager with uh, the department based in, uh, in Bunbury and uh, part of the food industry development team. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, the food industry development projects um, are funded by Royalties for Regions and it's about trying to support capability building, um, intelligence gathering, market development uh, opportunities for businesses and trying to support collaboration in the sector. And um, in fact, some, there's, I can see there's quite a few brewers here today and we're meeting after this event to see what we can do in terms of uh, practical partnering. Um, we also run a voucher program, which the Minister was down in Bustleton uh, on Friday, which was great, and there was quite a few people I can see here we were at that event, and that's a program to try and support uh, expert support services for businesses that are trying to get on a growth pr uh, trajectory. In this, work in this workshop, we're trialling for the first time a, a webinar, so we've got this live stream, so welcome to the people that are online today. Um, hopefully all the tech works well. Thanks to Lomax Media, a Bunbury-based company that are doing the services for us today. Um, so we welcome your feedback uh, for those who are online today to see how this works and hopefully we can juggle between the online camera and the, the live audience here. Um, and, um, and just before I start, just with some housekeeping things, the toilets are out the back uh, through here and some downstairs here and um, there's coffee and tea for those of you who are here. So prior to the commencement, um, I'd like to uh, conduct an acknowledgement of country in the, in the Noongar language, which is the Aboriginal nation whose traditional lands incorporate the South West region. And we've got our very own Nikki Polish from Albany, who's going to do the acknowledgement of country. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, John. Kaya Kaya, Nyan Karich Nija, Wajat, Wandi, Wadandi, Noongar Mutbuja, Wakura Kora, we yei wamila. Nan jerapan nija bujak, we kadich nidiga, we kura kura, we yei wamila. And that translates to, hello, hello. I acknowledge this is Noongar family country from long, long time ago to now to future. I'm happy to be on this country and acknowledge ancestors and elders from long, long time ago to now to future. Great, thanks Nikki. It's really important that we do acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. Um, before we commence, I'd like to just uh, go over a few other things. Could everyone just make sure their mobile phones are turned off or, or are put on silent? Um, I mentioned the toilet locations. Um, for online participants, during morning tea and discussions, we welcome yourself to, to get up and have a cup of tea or coffee and um, there'll be a time for, for, for breaks. So there are some takeaway handout notes that we'll email around for those of you who can't come. Um, and at any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions on the chat function. So please use that and uh, we'll try and get to those at, towards the end of the session. Um, as time allows, we may be able to address some also live um, and turn your audio on so there can be a little bit of interaction for the online people. Um, so that's pretty much for the introduction. I'd like to now introduce Ian Dixon. Um, Ian is based in South Australia, so has been in Perth for a couple of days, but he tells me he's been over here quite a bit in the past, dealing with local government amalgamations and all other sorts of things in the past, so knows the state very well. Um, since 1999, Ian's programs have built the partnering capability of countless individuals, organisations and sectors, empowering a new breed of future-focused collaborative leaders. Ian's work really is at the crux of transformational change and he has built a reputation throughout the Asia Pacific region as a strategic advisor, executive mentor and independent mediator of choice for many corporate government and not-for-profit organisations. Ian's specialty is the ability to bridge the divide between business, government, education and community. So I'd like to welcome Ian and we hope everyone enjoys the workshop today. Thanks Ian. Thanks very much, John and to Nikki, and um, great to be with you all here today. Don't hold the fact that I'm a South Australian against me. I, I come with uh, good intentions to try and help uh, work with you all 
and hopefully enlighten you a little bit about this whole subject of partnering. Um, and just to recap on a little bit to get started, um, I don't know if many of you are aware of the Partnering for Customer Value Initiative. Some of you probably are and, and may well have attended some presentations that have taken place over the last two years. But this particular uh, initiative created by the department, uh, what, several years ago, I understand, um, created a number of case studies, which many of you may have, uh, some of you may have seen. And there has also been some industry presentations uh, previously, which some of you... Have any of you attended some of those presentations? No? I've actually, today in the, in the workshop, we'll have a couple of little excerpts, uh, little takeouts of videos from those presentations as well, just to emphasise some of the points. So we'll pick up on that as well. Um, but really, where we are now, the focus up to date with that particular initiative, as I understand it, has been very much about what companies have been doing and what value they've been able to create through working differently, you know, partnering and through strategic relationships. So that was the purpose of the case studies, that was the purpose of the industry presentations. The purpose of today is really more about how to go about it. How do you actually partner? How might you actually come and work with other organisations effectively? When to do it, how to do it, what might you get out of it, basically? And try and do it with some simple processes and frameworks to help you navigate your way through. Uh, because as everybody says, partnering, oh, everybody partners. Partnering is everywhere. You hear it every day of the week. Uh, but there are lots of shades of partnering and not all is the same and not everyone can do it either. So that's the focus of today and what I want to do uh, in terms of the process, start off just talking a little bit about why partnering generally and take you a little bit to the global perspective uh, of just what's happening around the world in some of the, the really tough challenges and issues that are being faced and why partnering is now being seen as a, um, an enabler to solve some of those really tough problems. And then bring it back to why in the agri-food sector. Then we're going to unpack a little bit about the language of partnering. What is partnering? You know, what are these different relationships? And how might that relate to actually what you're doing in your particular context or situation? Then we'll go on to talk about how to partner. You know, so there's um, some guides, some approaches, uh, some simple tools, frameworks that I've developed over the years which have been used effectively. Um, a lot of them have come out of practical situations, businesses partnering with other businesses that I've been involved with or other particular uh, collaborations, etc. Uh, and they've actually developed out of that. You know, they've been learnings that have then been created into to some sort of tool or approach. Then towards the end, we're going to look a little bit about creating partnerships, how to get started, which is often the hardest thing to do, uh, especially if you may be competing with other organisations in one way, how might you effectively collaborate in one way, shape or form? And what could you do about that and in what ways? So we're going to tackle that a little bit later and then there's plenty of opportunity for Q&A. As we go through the workshop, there's a couple of areas where I'll actually say, here's a discussion, uh, have a bit of a discussion at the tables and then we'll have a large group discussion. So it's a bit of an opportunity to ask questions and, and as we go through. There's also some video clips as well. But what I'd suggest is that um, if I go through some of the presentation, I'll ask for questions. If there's any really critical point or issue that you want some clarification on, just sing out, put your hand up and, and let's just understand it. If my language is not matching with your understanding in any way, let's get clear at that stage, okay? So with that, why don't we get into it? So why partnering? Why do we hear all the time about collaboration and partnering? And in fact, if you look at the last 12 months with COVID, um, can anybody count the number of times that everybody said, we've got to, we're, in the, we're all in this together. You know, we have to work together, whether it's National Cabinet or whatever it is. And we've actually seen when people work together and absolutely when they don't. You know, we've seen both sides of the equation. But what we're seeing globally is all of these tough challenges that are happening all over the place. Um, is driving organisations, um, business, government, communities, etc., to seek out new ways of solving these problems. The traditional business models are not working. The traditional ways of working are not getting the results. So everybody is saying, how do we tackle these two hard basket issues? Because no um, entity, whether it be government, business, um, not-for-profits, uh, organisation, uh, or even groups of people can solve these by themselves. It's actually going to require greater collaboration. In fact, it was interesting even last week, Operation Ironside, did you guys hear over here about this massive um, uh, police, uh, global police effort in terms of cracking an organised 
uh, crime ring uh, with massive arrests in every state and overseas as well. And if you listen to the press release, I think partnering was used I don't know how many times during that press release. It required absolute, a different level of collaboration between uh, police in different jurisdictions all around the world to be able to solve that and crack that. So partnering is being sought after in terms of driving um, new ways of doing things and particularly in the innovation space, looking at new ways of approaches, new ways of doing things, different ways. Uh, it's a different sort of relationship. So partnering is actually a response, okay? Because the, as I said, the traditional models aren't working as they are now. Have many of you heard of the global goal, sustainable, sustainable development? It's a big issue I know and probably a long way from where you are and having to run your businesses and get stuff out the door, etc. But this is happening and it's been happening for many years um, and it is starting to drive down through here in Australia and right around the world. The critical thing I want to say here is in these large two hard basket areas, number 17, partnerships for the goals. Partnerships and partnering is being seen as the enabler for all of those areas to be tackled and to be solved. Now it's fairly ambitious, 2030 targets. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can read on this if you want to go online. But the important thing is, as I gain, partnering as an enabler, okay, to achieve something else. It's not an end in itself, it's an enabler to help you get somewhere. Just as a few quick examples, there's a vaccine alliance. This was actually started in 2000, um, and it's actually meant to help distribute vaccines to poorly developed countries uh, and uh, to help the distribution to uh, disadvantaged children. As you can see at the moment, this has got a very high um, prominence at the moment in terms of you know, the COVID response. Interestingly, another one, this is up in, the, in Queensland. Um, this is all to do with the nutrients, the runoff, fertiliser use, etc., and the runoffs into the Great Barrier Reef, or near the waters around it and causing damage on the reef. This collaboration has been going for years. World Wildlife Fund, Coca-Cola, uh, a number of NRMs, Natural Resource Management Groups, Bayer, etc. So it's trying to educate and work with farmers in terms of uh, fertiliser use, reducing nutrients going off and damaging the reef. So very innovative and challenging. You can imagine the, the challenges of working in that space with those groups around the table. This is an interesting one which uh, is in my backyard in South Australia. Um, have any of you heard of Michelle Wool? Very large, back in uh, the late 90s. And in fact, this, this initiative happened around about 2000. In the late 90s, um, their annual turnover was about 700 million. You know, so they were as big as the wine industry was at that stage, way back at that time of the year. Um, Michelle ran a wool processing plant north of Adelaide. Um, and what happened is um, they were located in the Salisbury Council area. Michelle Wool were one of the largest um, takers, offtakes, in terms of commercial water out of the Murray River. It was a massive cost to their business. The MD of Michelle happened to meet the CEO of the Salisbury Council. Salisbury Council had a massive stormwater problem issue where their stormwater from a very large area was running off into um, the estuaries of the Port River causing massive environmental damage. So there were massive problems with silt, everything else. So we had this situation where Michelle was sitting in this council area. They wanted water free or cheaper. They had too much water. They met at an event, started talking. And what actually happened was uh, a partnering uh, conversation developed into a new proposal that actually developed, um, we run through this, the Salisbury Council stormwater is now directed to wetland, so it's through aquifer recharge, goes underground, and then it's pumped up to supply, whoops, sorry, oh, there we are. It's pumped up to supply Michelle Wool. Okay, so there is no water taken from the Murray River at this point in time. Okay, and there is no runoff of stormwater into the sea. So it's a completely closed system. So it was a massive benefit to Michelle in terms of being able to develop this particular proposal. The interesting thing, and we'll touch on this later, is that the initial relationship and design of this was the partnering that took place, but then it turned into a water supply contract between the council and Michelle at a later stage. So it turned from a partnering relationship to a contractual relationship. And in a moment we're going to unpack that a little bit further. So there's just a few examples and just touching on the fact that you can see that partnering is being adopted in many, many sectors, many, many places globally. So why in the agri-food sector? 
I'm not sure if you've had a chance, you may not have looked back at those particular case studies. If you haven't, I'd really commend them to you. Um, I've had a look through them and there's some fascinating stories and insights. That's the actual written case studies and also the videos. But in terms of the agri-food sector, some of the key takeouts that I got out of that um, from just observing them, partnering could be a key enabler for creating new supply arrangements. I mean, that came back very clearly through the Mambula um, exercise. Developing innovative processing and distribution relationships, Dingley Dill, that was all about pork and a partnering relationship between um, a pork pig grower, basically, the supplier, and actually the meat processor. Really innovative uh, partnering over a long-term arrangement. Achieving premium pricing and improving customer value. So each of those case studies profile a number of the benefits that could be achieved and companies that actually achieve them through doing things differently. So that's the, the context of where we're working in. So the challenges of working together though can be extreme. Um, just some of the points. You know, everybody wants something different. Everybody can talk about working together, but when you actually sit in a room and sit across from somebody and actually having those conversations, uh, what are the questions that go through your head? Like, what's in this for me? You know? Uh, I mean, that's always the question at the start of this, if people get around the table, what's in it for us? The challenge is turning into what's in it for me to what's in it for us collectively, right? How can we all benefit, how can we benefit individually and how can we benefit together in some way, shape or form? But there's often a lack of understanding. Do we really understand the other organisations that we might want to work with? Um, language, we all have different language. Everybody uses different acronyms. Um, the power relationships, you know, a large organisation, small organisation. I remember years ago when I was um, involved in the Department of Industry and Trade, heading up that agency in South Australia, we were trying to encourage the IT sector and the IT industry to work together and to collaborate. The small IT companies were absolutely paranoid about the fact of large IT companies and just being absolutely taken over. So they couldn't see a way that they could work with them it was either we work together as a small organisation or they buy us out and take us over. You know, there was that fear of, of, uh, of working together, the power relationship. Not everybody knows how to partner and often a lack of process. A lot of um, collaboration and partnering, people talk about it a lot, but there's very little out there about how to actually do it. It's just assumed that everybody can work together. And in fact, you'll hear it all the time, every day of the week. Oh yeah, we work together, we work together, we collaborate, we partner. Do they? And does it work? There's a lot of, lot of um, history around a lot of alliances and collaborations that haven't worked over the years. So that's what we're faced with. It all sounds good. It's good rhetoric. Everybody talks about it. Uh, it's a feel-good sort of word, um, but it's almost got a bit meaningless in a way because um, just because someone says they're partnering, it could be totally different to the way someone else does it. Not all partnering is the same. So let's start to unpack this a little bit. Um, so what do we mean by partnering? Anybody like to volunteer a suggestion? What do you think of partnering? I mean, you hear this all the time. So what goes through your mind when you actually hear this word partnering? Yep, by, by combining your various products, yep. you know, putting them together, you can add value in some way, shape or form. Yep. So bringing together uh, contributions or whatever, resources, whatever you've got. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Mutual benefit. Yeah, something that's mutually benefit. You know, it's not just benefiting one organisation or the other. Anything else? Creating value. Yep. So it's got to be for a purpose. You've got to have to do something. Great. And that's pretty well spot on. This is a a definition, a very general high level de definition of partnering that my international colleagues sort of have used for years and I've used as a, a broad definition. So it's between organisations, working relationship between organisations who commit to collaborating to pursue a common purpose, you know, to create value, to do something, but getting very clear on what it is that you want to do, okay? Because often when you come into a, a, a relationship um, wanting to work with someone else, you've got an idea what you think it's about. The other person may not have exactly the same idea. You know, it's getting everybody on the same page and understanding that that's critical. This is absolutely fundamental, sharing risks and benefits. 
Okay? Not only the benefits, but sharing the risks as well. Contributing agreed resources, expertise, information. You know, so how can you do that? So that's... Okay. So that's a broad definition, but in terms of looking at that, it doesn't really tell us a lot about the different sorts of relationships you could be in, because this word, as I said, is used in many different forms. So what we want to do is try and unpack it a little bit and just break it down. So this is just a little example. So do any of you sponsor local community groups? Do any of your organisations or businesses? You know? Yep. Okay. So. Do you describe that as a straight sponsorship, or would you perhaps say we're partnering with the local community? Um, well, I've done some very small ones where... Sorry. Just down here. Apologies, I'll try and help out from the front here as well. Okay, yes. Sorry, Serge. Um, well, we've sponsored some, some small businesses, uh, sorry, some small charity events yep. where it's... Uh, Sort of, it's, it's only partnering is so much that I'm offering free goods, which they can then use and take benefit of. Yeah. And that's my way of giving to the community. And I've also done larger sponsorships like, um, you know, sort of state level sporting clubs where it's a contractual agreement. So uh, yep. we partner together, I give them stock uh, in return for promotional activity. Great, you're almost going through the continuum here, that's good. So, but in terms of partnering, Often sponsorships, organisations will say, we partner with a local community, okay? But often it is sponsorships, a direct gift in effect of either dollars or resources, pretty much a, a, what I call a donor recipient, you know, it's a one-way type relationship. So that's at one end of the spectrum, and we see a lot of that, and that's probably the majority we see. Then we see a lot of what we call transactional type relationships, the second bit you just mentioned there, about how you might actually contribute something, right? Um, some goods or get something back. It's a two-way exercise. Another classic case is say you're in a business, um, you want to do a particular project, you haven't got all the resources or capabilities yourself, you need to engage a subcontractor or someone else to actually provide that extra resource, that capability, whatever it is, uh, to be able to do the job. It's a transaction, but it's contractual. It's underpinned by a contract, okay? Um, and that's a transactional type relationship. And that's probably the majority of what you guys are doing and the majority of what we're in day to day. You know, we do something, we want to get something done, there's a contract that underpins it, transactional type relationship. But there's another way of operating, okay, in a more integrated fashion, okay, which is at the other end of the spectrum, where you may not know what the actual answer is to a problem. You know, if you've got a particular issue or challenge, you may not be able to solve it yourself. It's not a simple subcontracting relationship, transactional type thing you can do to get there, but you feel you need to work with others in terms of coming up with a new solution. Okay? That's a more integrated way of working, like a joint venture in effect. But it may not be a formal joint venture, it may be a voluntary collaboration you know, underpinned by a partnering agreement, not a legal contract. So that's a lot of the space that I want to explore with you today about how you might do that. Now, if you put these three together, you actually get what we call a partnering continuum, okay? Which is a really neat way of kind of separating out where your relationships are. So if you look at this from the sponsorship at one end, to the transaction, to the integration on the right-hand end, and just underneath, the sponsorship's principally one way, minimal exchanges. I mean, you might just write out a cheque once a year, you know? You're not going to be intimately involved with that organisation necessarily. Um, low resources and potentially limited benefits. If you look at the transaction, there has to be a more active engagement, doesn't there? A more two-way arrangement when you're working with another organisation. Um, there's often a resource exchange, can be quite specific. There's a higher level of trust, and there's a greater strategic value and mutual value growth, okay? So as we're working from left to right, we're building trust, okay? If we get across to the right-hand side, this is more like a highly integrated joint venture. There's a high level of commitment and shared ownership. We're all in this together, okay? And high levels of trust, but this is where the potential for major strategic value, you know, added value occurs at that end. But it's not easy, okay? Um, this, is the, this is the hard space to work in at that right-hand end. 
Um, and I'm certainly not coming here today as the um, prophet around partnering and encouraging you to partner on everything. What this is really about is to say, partnering is one business approach, it's one model, but don't enter into it unless you know something about it and you know when to partner and you've got some idea of how to do it. Or otherwise it will take a lot of time, it'll consume you um, and you could end up not getting the, the return on investment that you're really seeking. So this is where we know what the answer is, we can define it and it's usually underpinned by contracts in some way, shape or form. That on the right hand side is where we don't necessarily know what the answer is, but it's a way of coming together and coming up with new solutions, innovation, creativity, new ways of doing things. So, the other thing about this relationship is that on the left hand side here, that vertical line, that's usually the power relationship. If you're giving money to the community, the power's sitting with you, Serge, isn't it? I mean, you decide, I mean, you may not think that, but in inherently, I mean, you decide whether you're going to give money to that group or that group or that group, okay? The group accepting the money doesn't have any control over that, okay? So what I call a vertical type relationship. As we move across to transaction, across to integration, if you're going to work in that right-hand side of the spectrum, you've got what, you need to have what I call a horizontal relationship, where there is equity of decision-making. So if you're coming together, if two or three of you in this room actually want to get together and form a, you know, some sort of partnering, you know, group or whatever, uh, around some particular purpose, um, What's the balance of power, okay? And this is where partnering often, uh, and particularly when we look at federal government grant funding, state government funding, etc., it kind of undermines a lot of this with partnering because partnering to governments is usually grant funded. It's underpinned by money. Money is going out to organisations. And often they will say, we want, they'll actually put a requirement in their funding that we want organisations to work together, whether it's in mental health or whatever it is, or in your area, they might say, yeah, you, that's good, NRMs, but you've got to work together. Um, but then they'll say, but we want a lead person because we want to have a contract with a lead partner, okay? So once you set up a lead partner, where are the other partners sitting, okay? Have we got this sort of relationship or have we got this sort of relationship? So you can see this is where some of the confusion comes with language and understanding around partnering as a concept and how it can get misconstrued. And because of that, you don't actually achieve the, the potential benefits. And I don't, you may not have seen it. Some of you said you haven't been to the previous presentations, but if you actually look on the DPIRD website, this is actually the partnering for customer value spectrum that they've come up with, where they call it transactional relationship to strategic relationship and it talks about customer development models, value chain partnering, enabling you to understand and develop and clear, requiring a shift to customer value and supplying a whole product. So there's some, some ideas and some concepts there that align very much with what I'm presenting today. So it's moving to different sorts of relationships when the time is right. So what I was going to ask you to do, just for a few minutes now, um, is just have a discussion at your tables and you guys might just want to move to another table so there's a group. Just think about that continuum and just think about some of the relationships that you're in at this time and where they might sit on that continuum. I'll flick back to the slide. So if we go back to there. Just in terms of what I've said today, where do you think most of your relationships sit? Are they like Serge? I think from what you were saying, you've obviously got some sponsorships and you've got something in this space. Have you got anything potentially over there? I don't know. But have a think about that and discuss it. And the other useful thing of this sort of continuum is that you can say, yeah, we've got a relationship with company X or organisation Y. It's a really good one. We've got a good level of trust, but we could take it to another level. You know, we've actually got this challenge, this problem at the moment. How do we get from there to there? So you can move up and down the spectrum. There's no right or wrong here. It's just understanding what relationship we're in at what time for what purpose. And it could be that you're in this, working with the same organisation, you know, a grower and a, you know, a grower and a wholesaler, retailer, whatever. Um, you could have a supply contract, okay, underpinned by a contract, but at certain times you might want to go into a different sort of relationship to solve a particular problem, be it a distribution problem or accessing new markets or doing whatever. So they're not necessarily exclusive. 
but you need to understand, first of all, what relationships you're in. Well, let's keep going, because what I'd like to do is just unpack this a little bit further and say, where, where does this lead us in terms of uh, partnering as such? So it's pretty clear that if we want to get into that right-hand side where these are strategic relationships as such, some of the things we need is we need to have a very clear common purpose. Everybody around the table needs to have a clearly agreed purpose for why you're doing it. And I often use the example that um, when I'm talking to groups in that process, that if I'm standing outside the door and I interviewed everybody as they came out of a meeting and I said, what's the purpose of your partnering? Would they all say exactly the same thing? Would they all describe it in exactly the same way? And when I've said that to groups that are actually partnering, everybody goes, very few occasions has everybody said, yep, we're all totally agreed. And what happens is it's very hard to get that purpose agreed at the start and maintain it. Because over time, it gets pulled and pushed and people want to move it to another area, often to suit what they may want. But you need high levels of trust, and that came up in the discussion over here, absolutely incredible levels of trust. High level of commitment and shared ownership. Over a, over a long term, this, this isn't a short exercise, you need to share the power and control. This is not one large organisation bringing a group together and thinking, oh, this is good, I can you know, use this, we're partnering. And it often happens. We see, yes, we're partnering with this group and it's just a straight, you can see the power relationships, you can see the funding arrangements. Honest, open communication and the sharing of risks and benefits. Absolutely fundamental. So there's some of the things you need if you're going to operate in that space. The other thing you need is time because you can see that with the level one relationships, you can have lots of sponsorships because you may not, it may not take a lot of time to manage that. Similarly with transactions, if you're doing tenders, etc., you need more time to do those. But when you get to the level three and you're working on that right-hand side, it will take time. So if you're thinking of coming together with groups of other organisations, you need to have the capacity to be able to invest the time and effort. Because if you don't, you know, the chances of success are, are limited. This actually came out of an example when I was working with a company, Sage Automation. Do any of you know Sage? They've got offices over here, Process Automation. Um, do a lot of it. They were working with a New Zealand company called SeaTech and they were looking to partner. And the managing director of Sage, Andrew Downs, uh, I mean they're a $150 million company or more now, they've done amazingly success, successful. Um, Andrew said, I partner with everybody. We partner all the time with everybody. And I said, Andrew, you do not partner with everybody in exactly the same way. He defined level one as his individual electrical subcontractors that work for him. He had a great partnering relationship, he said, with those, but it was effectively an engagement, a hiring relationship. At times, they would become part of a consortia and they would put major tenders in, for like the Gladstone port or something, where Balderstones or a major infrastructure provider would actually be putting them up, they'd be the, the main tenderer, but they would have a number of other groups that would come and form part of that consortia. So that was a strategic partnering type relationship. And then they had a different sort of relationship, which is how they saw their relationship with SeaTech in New Zealand, because they wanted to get into new markets. They were trying to get access India and grow into India. So they saw that they could have a different sort of relationship here. Sure, with SeaTech they might still have a, you know, win a project and need SeaTech to bring some of their technical competence, but they could flick into a, a different sort of relationship in accessing that new market. So that's how they defined it. And, but they realised that it would take significant time to do it. One other thing I'd like to explore with you is that, and this is just a generic slide, and I normally have business, government, community, not-for-profits there, and I've just produ put producers, processors, retailers, distributors in your context, for example, to really point out that if you were coming together in any of those combinations, and I'm not suggesting you would all necessarily come together, but to show that when you actually do come together, there are the people across the table. Say I was partnering with you, Ryan, I might contact you, we might actually have a discussion and then we start having a meeting or maybe with two or three others, with Serge and Janelle, you know, we get together, we're having conversations. So there's the people at the table that are actually engaged in those discussions. But then very importantly, there's who's sitting behind you, Ryan, in your organisation? Who's sitting behind Serge and, Lynn and Janelle? You know, like the partnership is not just the individuals at the table. It is much broader, and that's why I define it as the partnering ecosystem. 
and there can even be external stakeholders that may not be actively involved in the partnering but could have a huge influence on what actually happens. So you need to understand that just by having some people sitting around a table, that not necessarily is a partnership. Individual, it starts by individuals getting together, but for it to be sustainable in the long term, you need to embed it into organisations. Because it may not be in your area as much, but in, say, the mining sector, where I do a lot of work, there's a massive churn rate. You know, so say a mining company partnering with an Aboriginal group, a native title for social licence, the Aboriginal community will be there forever, and often the same people in that executive. The mining company, the turnover could be extreme. So the goodwill of one particular CEO of a mining company going out to an Aboriginal group may be terrific and initiate a partnering relationship, but how's it going to be sustained over the life of the mine for 20, 30 years? So the challenge is to take it from this conversation around the table to what I call getting buy-in back within each of the organisations. And you've got to build that progressively as you work through a partnering process. So again, these are some of the other things that need to be considered in actually thinking about if we're partnering with others, we're not just partnering with the people at the table, we're partnering with their organisations. And you need to understand, okay, you might know what's going on in your organisation, but what's going on in theirs, okay? If Ryan says something and is that supported by his organisation? Are you the key decision maker or not? I don't know. You know, so it depends who's at the table. And the same thing, you could have CEOs sitting there or managing directors sitting there. How do you know that the things are going to happen? They've got to be able to sell it within their organisations and get the others within the organisation to be part of it. So now I'd like to just touch on now moving to creating value through partnering. And I'd like to refer back to some work that my international colleagues and the partnering initiative are doing because they're trying to tackle this particularly around those sustainable development goals, you know, like how do we actually define value? Now they've got like a 60 page book lot on it, so I'm not going to go through that, but just to pull out some of the fundamental highlights of this to consider in your context. Before we get to that though, I just want to show this and reflect on this, what I have a simple value equation here is that, and reflecting back on the, the three stages again, the three different types of relationships on that spectrum. The sponsorship, and this is purely not mathematical, but illustrative, okay? Um, it's a one plus one equals one. I mean, the value created through that process is, and I think it was discussed there, reputational value. I think you were saying, sorry, it's Phil, isn't it? Yeah, Paul. Uh, you were saying, Paul, about some of your work with uh, community groups and how you try and move it from level one to level two, but you're looking at, obviously, the positive benefit, reputational value, et cetera, which is a lot of what this is about, isn't it, in the sponsorship? It's being a good corporate or good community citizen giving something back and being a part of it. When you get to hear the transactional space though, um, that's the one and one plus two. You know, I've got something, you've got something, we put it together, we create more. You know, we can do a job or do something. The integration is the one plus one equals three, right? That's the added value, it's the extra you can get um, through coming together in that sort of fashion. And I don't know if you've heard it before, but often people talk about partnering as, oh yeah, it's all about the greater than the sum of the parts. You know, it's all this extra stuff we're gonna create through partnering. So people often go into it thinking that and end up back here with different expectations and understanding. So just with that in mind, there's the opportunity to create added value on that right-hand side, but it needs some work to get there. In terms of looking at as a whole, if you were looking at your partnership as a whole, there's two aspects. There's the input added value, the collaborative advantage towards delivering the goal. So in other words, what are the bits that come together? What are the various resources? It could be networks, intelligence, um, resources, all of the things that you can actually put into it, okay? Now, I might have some of those things. Serge, you might have some. Ryan might have some. We put it all together. We get a collaborative advantage by doing so. The challenge is that by doing that, we get greater output, you know? The delta is the amount of change, right? The added value. So achieving outcomes greater than the sum of the parts. So it's just a different way of what I was saying on the previous slide. If we look at the, to each business, there still has to be a value add to your business, doesn't it? I mean, if there's, I mean, the fundamental question is what's in it for us? Unless there's some individual benefit, I can't imagine any of you staying in a partnering relationship very long at all, you know? There's gotta be some bottom line gain out of it. 
So there has to be a gain by the business in sales, profits, funding, positioning, etc. But you really kind of need to have both, don't you? You need to have that mutual benefit of the whole and you need to have the individual benefits as well. But the question is when to partner and when not to partner. And the summary here is there needs to be a strong alignment of interest and capability between potential partners. So if you're thinking of coming together in a group, is there an alignment of interest? Is there sufficient compatibility? Is there a clear collaborative advantage? Is there benefits of putting our things together? You know, we've all got different competencies or resources, whatever we've got that we can put into the centre. And is e each partner achieving a net benefit greater than working alone after accounting for all the costs? Because remember the time that needs to be costed into this as well in going over a particular path. So that's a very quick little summary of just thinking about how value can be added through partnering and being very clear that different sorts of relationships can create different types of value. So in understanding what relationships you're in now and where you can take those relationships, what extra value you may or may not be able to achieve through doing so. Another little conversation to get you thinking about that in your context. What opportunities do you see in increasing value through partnering in your value chain? Now I think some of the conversation before started to get into that space, moving from a level two to a level three. Are there other opportunities you can see? And I think, Paul, you were talking about going from, moving from sponsorship to trying to get to some of those into level two Absolutely. transaction. So, you know, what else, what's the extra value? You know, you could see or opportunities through other supply chain partnering, et cetera. So, thought might have another discussion at the tables again, just a few minutes, five minutes or so. Just think about that, I'll see how you're going. What's the value add that you think in your value chain? And I'm using value chain, is that a term that you're, you use or do you use supply chain? I'm talking about value chain. I think you don't know what we're meaning. Want to give that a go? Okay. So just try and translate this. I mean, this is all the, the theoretical stuff and I'm presenting this stuff, but what does this mean in your context? What does this mean in your value chain? You know, with where you're working at the moment? Can you see some value opportunities that perhaps you're not exploring at the moment that by working differently, you could actually achieve some greater value? So it's just a thinking about it, a bit of brainstorming at that level, okay? So perhaps what we might do for those online, we might just have a break for five to 10 minutes, let you discuss it yourselves or have some thoughts and send that back through uh, online to Nikki and she can raise it back in the general group, okay? Thank you. Okay, obviously some good conversations happening at the table, so let's have a bit of a large group conversation this time. I'm not going to let you off the hook now, this time. I want to hear something back in terms of uh, what your thoughts are. Um, you know, this is the key, isn't it? This is about how can you increase value, you know, to your businesses? You know, how do you get some growth? You know, can you do things differently? How might you do it differently? And after the break, in a while, we're going to be talking all about the how-to partner in actually going through the systems and processes. But this is the bit about why would we be doing it in the first place and what value could we actually achieve. So any thoughts, insights, anything you'd like to share? Or you're scared of sharing amongst others because you're in competition with each other. <laughs> it's Chatham House, no worries. Okay, yes, over here. Um, our group actually um, talked about with the value chain actually working as all of the businesses together for the common goal. Um, so like if you're looking, just one example, at the export market, each individual one to have actually any um, shipping container space or any of that it's not logistically viable for the individual companies, but if you work together, it then becomes a very viable option. So there's some real opportunities there to do that. Yeah, fantastic. It doesn't have to be actually putting a, a particular opportunity forward, but it's just thinking about, is this making sense to you? Is it actually, you know, have you, have you done this analysis? Have you actually gone through this with your supply chains in great, or value chains in great detail, looking at the different relationships? Um, do you see it of value to do so? Do you see it of value to actually explore different sorts of relationships? What's your thinking about that? Um, I think through some of the value added chain, 
I guess through developing those partnerships, you find stuff out that you didn't know yourself, particularly if you are, so at the moment, we're looking at partnering with somebody in Cambodia, and he actually had 120 stores here in Australia that he was already supplying that we didn't know about. So you can get a value-added chain that yep. you didn't know that was even available locally when it's from overseas. Wow, interesting, isn't it? So it may be just information and it could be access to networks you know, that you're not aware of. Yeah, absolutely. So when you start exploring this and digging down, a whole lot of stuff can come up. Any other thoughts? Is this resonating for you? Anything popping up? Or is it just you prefer to have conversations as a small group? <laughs> Not with me. <laughs> We've just got an online question or a comment um, from George Ainsley from Ainsley Agroforestry and Aquaponics. He said he's just looking at ways of increasing value for production coupled with big European food businesses. So, yeah, good, good to have that connection with our online people as well. Um, Excellent. Thanks. Fantastic. Okay, so do you all agree that there's opportunities to look at different sorts of relationships and the op there are opportunities for increased value? Does anyone disagree with that thought? Okay. No? Okay. But at this stage, can I just get a bit of a feel for where you're at in your individual groups or businesses? I mean, some of you are brewers here, aren't you? Is that right? There's a number of you? Now, you're meeting this afternoon, I gather. Is that right? There's a bit of a clustering discussion or about potential okay, um, to get together. So you haven't met before? Is that right? So this, this is going to be the first meeting. So later on I'm going to talk about getting started. <laughs> so I've got a few slides there that might be of interest to you <laughs> when you get to that. And I wasn't aware actually until late last night that you were actually having that meeting. So uh, that'll be interesting. Um, but look, just in terms of value, um, do you ha I mean, in the actual uh, case studies that were presented previously, um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about different sorts of value, you know, brand value, you know. Um, increasing that, differentiating your products. You know, there's lots of ways of achieving added value as such. I guess what I'm talking about here is the added value potential out of partnering along the value chain, you know, having different relationships with different parts of your value chain. I mean, just as a question, how easy or hard do you think that is to form different sorts of relationships along your supplier or value chain? I mean, some of you, are, you're grappling with one, aren't you? Sorry, Claire? Yeah, you're grappling with one at the moment, I think. You've got a number of people. You're in one of these potentially level three type relationships that you're trying to, to grapple with. In the very early stages at the moment, so yeah. it's, you know, difficult. Um, I don't know how, how hard it's going to be, you know. It's just in the initial stages, but, yeah, it's just difficult seeing all the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle when you haven't got the um, box in front of you. There must be something though, some perceived value that you're seeing after putting you through this process my at the whole, end day. Yeah. My whole um, value is the sustainability of it. Mine's a Save the World project, but that's just me. I see value oh. for every business in sustainability and I think it's going to become more important down the track, but that's just my little soapbox. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. Uh, it's interesting. Um, just as an aside, um, as I said, I've been doing work in the mining industry previously and What's amazed me is that they're saying the shift um, in the way the investment environment is heading in the mining industry is staggering. You know, I meet people in the company and then I go back two months later and they say things are moving so fast. The way that investors are now looking at social licence, you know, the Rio exercise, they're looking at investing in sustainable products and various other things uh, and we're seeing many investors now not investing in certain things, as you know. I think um, from, you know, the young people coming forward, you know, I've got a daughter who has moved to an ethical bank, you know, and I think we're going to yep. be kept in line by the young generation coming through and I think that they're, they're going to buy on sustainability values and, yep. you know, you had your all your, um, you know, sustainability goals up there. I think you can contribute to a lot of those goals um, and I think it's going to become increased value for every business down the track. Uh, and I think that's the key. I mean, this is a, an absolute driver that's happening globally to, to move or to encourage organisations to think of things differently, to look at increased and different ways of value. Uh, it's interesting, later on we get to the Dingley Dell, and I'll show you the video later on about the pork grower in, in the UK. Um, and he, 
we don't actually show this part of the video, but he talks at one stage about how he used to take chefs out just to actually look at the pigs, basically, and meet the pigs, you know, and the way they came up and they were friendly pigs and the way they were treated and looked after, etc. And so that's what he thought of. But he was also growing in another part of the project. Um, I think it's a million bees project where he's, you know, he wanted to create, because of the shortage of bees, etc., this whole bit of pasture where there's a whole lot of bee. Bees would grow and recover uh, in this part of England. And uh, then he started taking the chefs, not just to see the pigs, to see the other parts of the, the property and what he was doing there, and they were blown away. So that was a, an absolute value add created to him in terms of getting connected um, to those chefs you know, who are marketing in some of the best restaurants around the world. So there are a lot of drivers happening, and we haven't got time to go into all of them today, but it's, uh, it's certainly a lot of drivers there looking at different ways along the value chain. Anything else that came up, or well, just any thoughts, insights? Yeah, Ryan. Sorry, just a sec, we'll just get the microphone. And then back to Serge. I think maybe for a lot of us as small businesses, the opportunity of achieving scale in your value chain um, and the way value is realised there is by lowering your costs, obviously. So yeah. uh, a few of us have touched on cold chain and um, that's a big one out of the regions and yeah. that's what we're talking about here today. And in the regions, getting product to market, which is generally metropolitan area, is the bigger part of the market. So I see that as an opportunity. Um, I even see bigger companies moving more towards uh, outsourcing their distribution because they look at their own freight systems and look at the cost of capital to maintain that and they're moving away from it. So I think, you know, we're starting to see some bigger, more able transport companies, which um, I think is going to have to happen given the amount of growth we're expecting down here in the next five to ten years. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, great. So did you have a comment you were going to make? Yeah. Um, this is also, you know, moving on from what uh, Ryan just said as well about opportunity for scale. Um, in my particular instance, I already have a very good distributor in the metro area who we have a partnership where, um, you know, I have the brand and all the infrastructure to produce that, uh, yet he has a lot of knowledge. Um, you know, years and years of experience in sort of corporate level, you know, FMCG, uh, products and things. So uh, I just think that the knowledge is a, a, yep. a really good way to increase value um, mm. in a partnership. Yeah. You know, someone's experience, you may have a product, but you need somebody with experience to help grow that brand and also, you know, for sales as well, you know. Yeah. It's something that I can't do in terms of my business. I, I'm good at producing the product, but when it comes to, to mm. sales and knowledge, where to go, how to get into the larger change, Yep. I, have, I have no experience in there, mm. so that's where my value comes in. Yeah, it's uh, uh, excellent. And that again brings me to that Dingley Dell example where you know, the, the pork grower is there and he's got a, exactly a partnership with a meat uh, processor and distributor. You know, the grower grows the pigs and does all the branding and does all the marketing and you know, from that point of view. And the processor actually just processes the meat and distributes and gets it there. You know? And it's just it's a win-win all, all told you know, through long years of, of relationship, etc. But the key thing was that was brought out in the case study was that the learning that each finds from each other when they went off on joint study tours, etc. And, and going into different markets. So there's a lot of good information out there and a lot of good examples and that sounds great. Excellent. Okay. Well, what I'd like to do now is I'm just going to show you a little video of um, just an, a little small bit um, about Marie Picconi, who's the Managing Director of Mambula Mangoes, um, and she's talking about partnering with Coles and what led her to doing that. And uh, so we'll just have a little bit of a quick look at this video. I was sitting in a Woolworths meeting and we beat in Coles, all of us, the same group that represented about 50% of mango production. We've been in the same meeting the week before at uh, Coles. So we're sitting there talking you know, to Coles about how we're, what we're all going to do to make, life, make their retail offer better and how we're the great partner. And sitting in Woolworths as well. And I thought back to the vision that I had when we did our first business plan. And it was to be a major part and an important part of the best mango retail offer in Australia or any country we're in. And I thought, how can I do that with two partners? 
And even though we were the biggest KP growers, even then, we were the biggest independent, you know, biggest individual KP growers in Australia, I thought, I can't work with two chains. I'm flat out keeping up in terms of the volume or whatever with one, as well as doing some export. So um, we had offers from both, and because Coles were so hungry, and I've got, not, got the greatest regard for Woolworths, I really have, even though I know that both have done some hideous things over the years, but overall there's been some good initiatives. Um, but I just, Coles was just more appealing to me at the time. And um, so I went with Coles. I had the other suppliers saying to me, go and get that vendor number at Woolworths Marie. Go and get it, what do you think you're doing? You know, go get it, you're crazy. And, um, and I hadn't said to anybody I was just going to go with Coles. Um, but it's been one of the better decisions that I think I've made. And it doesn't mean it should be anybody else's decision. But based on what I knew our volume projections were, and based on what I knew the, the sunny side could be for Coles, and the hunger of the team, and the alignment of what we wanted to achieve, and the support they were prepared to give me, um, I just, and the openness with which they approached me, the group, compared to the other approaches we had, I thought, this is the one for me. And um, we gone, you know, in 2007, um, Coles, they won't mind me saying this, Coles had 13% of the mango market in Australia and um, now they have between 26 and 29% depending on the year. And a lot of that is on the back of the initiatives between Coles and us that, and then some others follow. But we very much work the category and, and drive the early part of the season and then the entire season with them. So it's been a very strong relationship. A long video. If any of you haven't seen it, I'd really encourage you, if you've got interest, to go back and look at it. It's about an hour or so, I think, the full video. Uh, but there's some really, really good um, points, not just around partnering, but about the whole way that she took the brand and developed export markets, etc. Um, some fantastic learnings, as, as per the other videos as well. So, we're nearly at the break time. Any questions? I mean, this bit this morning, the first half has been very general in terms of the broader picture of partnering, a little bit unpacking the language. After the break, we're going to get into the, the more nitty gritty of the actual how-to, which is obviously more relevant, probably interesting for you in terms of that. But is there anything from this morning's session so far that any questions you might have or issues? Yes. Um, on one of your slides, you actually had the picture where it's had the four colours and it was sort of talking about um, the retailers, the actual, yeah. um, and you said it goes back to the CEO or MD to then sell the opportunities into that business. Have you got any insight when there's resistance within the business to how to sell that to the business, <laughs> the benefits that can be, or you know, even if it's going to be part of later? Can, can, I, um, can I mention that out of all of the challenges that I've found with partnering over the last 20 years and getting groups together, what's the biggest issue that people come back with is how to sell it internally, okay? Because what actually happens is when people actually start engaging across the table, and this will probably happen this afternoon if a group gets together and you start to have conversations and you're all in that together. But if you're not careful, you can end up being a little bubble that's disconnected from your actual host organisations. And the challenge often for those individuals will be to go back out of that meeting and start to convince others as to how to do it. Yes, we will talk more about it after the break, but it's, it's a significant challenge, and that's why I put that slide up now, because um, you could have, say, one organisation, I could be at the table with Ryan, I could have terrific buy-in, right? Great, right back up to all of levels of my organisation. Ryan's really enthusiastic and wants to be involved, but he's struggling, right? How does he get there? So is that partnership going to go anywhere? Probably not. So in this next session, as I said, we're going to look very much at how to partner, um, in a general sense, and go through some principles, some frameworks, some ideas, some concepts that we've shared over quite a few years. And then also a little bit later, talk a little bit more specifically about getting started, some of the critical things to happen at that stage, which hopefully will help those. Because uh, often it's getting started, how to initiate those conversations, how to get started in something can be very difficult. Um, but there are some, some key things to, to consider at that time. So what I'd like to do first of all is, um, talk about the foundation principles. 
Mike, if you're having a relationship with another organisation, and now I'm talking about this level three, right? We're talking about integrated partnering up at that end of the, the spectrum. Um, what we've found over the years, and my colleagues overseas, over 20 plus years of experience, there needs to be some fundamental underlying principles in place in relationships. So if you think about it, in any relationship that you've got, um, what do you think might be some of the key fundamental principles that underpin a relationship that you think are really, really important that you'd want to have in place? Anyone like to volunteer? Trust. Trust. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Fundamental. We've talked about it a lot today. It's come up a lot in discussions. Trust. Anything else? Security. Security in... Do you want to... Yeah, yeah they're, they're credible business as such. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's important, but as a relationship, I'm talking about the really foundation level. So say you're in a, in a relationship, say we're in a relationship, what would be really important? The underlying values, the underlying principles of our relationship. Respect, okay? Yeah, so trust, respect, okay? In a partnering relationship, so anything else you can think of? Communication. Communication's important, yep. Shared vision, yep. Or, and it was mentioned earlier, mutual benefit. So let's have a look at this. So there's three fundamental principles that my colleagues developed in their research, and I've just used them with their permission over the years. And these are typical ones that appear uh, in most relationships, but there are others that you can add. And what I encourage groups coming together is to, when they have their early conversations is to sit down and say, what's important about how we work together? Okay. And just these three, just to give you an example of how it works, equity. You remember I talked about power and control? If we're looking at this end of the spectrum, we want a horizontal relationship. So we need equity. And why? Because that leads to respect. Okay? It's respecting everybody. Um, over the years, I've done an awful lot of work between mining, as I said, and native title groups, native title negotiations, indigenous land use agreements. That was all about trying to, my role, trying to, to help the parties actually stay with equal power. So the major mining companies, the Oz Minerals, the BHPs, etc., aren't completely dominating um, the Aboriginal groups as such, that they feel that they've got a voice at the table. The other one is transparency, okay? Sharing of information. Sharing as much as you can, you know, within limits. Or even if you can't share stuff, saying why you can't share it, okay? And why? because this builds trust. The greatest way to build trust in earlier relationships is sharing of information. I've seen um, company CEOs sitting down with groups uh, sharing amazing amounts of information, which I thought some of it was ASX sort of, you know, limited. You know, I was surprised they were even able to share it. And what has happened is that you could almost, you could almost feel the trust level rising in the room. Okay, it was that obvious. So don't underestimate sharing of information in the early stages particularly to build that foundation of trust. And the other one, of course, is mutual benefit um, as a key principle because there's got to be something in it collectively, as has been mentioned earlier today. Why? Because it's, it keeps it sustainable. If it just goes back to one you know, partner ends up getting most of the benefits, do you reckon the other partners are going to stay involved for long? Probably not. So these are just three principles that might underpin a relationship. Others could be accountability. Um, it could be communication like saying what we think, you know, at all times, being absolutely honest and open in our communication. So what I'm trying to encourage is that um, we have these relationships. If you can have some conversations about what's really important about the foundation, because when things go wrong, when things get difficult, when things go challenging, these are the things that you can fall back on, right? And usually, when things do go wrong, it's because one of these things isn't working. Either there isn't a mutual benefit, or there isn't transparency, or there's not equity, okay? And of course, with lack of transparency, it's the old hidden agendas. And I'm sure all of you have been in situations where, you know, if say another organisation or someone in a relationship doesn't say something, and you immediately think, what's going on here? Is there something else going on? You know, I'm not getting the, the communication I need to really you know, build that level of trust. So please don't underestimate that. So there's some foundational principles. 
The other things I talk about are critical components of partnering. And this is really not difficult. It's not rocket science. First of all, I talk about purpose, which we've mentioned earlier. I talk about people. And I talk about process. And if you think about that, purpose is all about the what. What are we actually doing? What is the purposes of purpose of coming together to actually do something or work in a different way? What is going to be the one thing that holds us together and drives us to continue to work with all the ups and downs and all the pressures of our own business and everything else that's going on? What's going to drive us to it? Okay, that has to be clear, you know, and has to be fully agreed. People is all about the who. Who needs to be involved? Have we got the right players at the table? Have we got the right people at the table? Have we got the right organisations there? And the interesting thing with this is, you may end up with a core group of partners, but you may have other organisations that you can still bring in to supply particular competencies or skills or knowledge that you may not have. You know, so you can think about, yeah, we may want 10 organisations, but actually there might be a core group of three or four. You know? So you've got to think about those sort of connections. And the last one is process, which is all about the how. Okay, so pretty basic, isn't it? What, who, how. But can I share with you that in all the years I've been doing this, people get lost in the fog of relationships. You know, um, who said this, who said that, who did this. Um, and I've actually had very experienced partnership brokers, um, some of my colleagues, that have been working entwined in you know, major not-for-profits, other things which has become dysfunctional, and they can't see the wood for the trees. So they bring in someone outside, I've been asked to come in, and just by coming in and doing something, you can see that what's happening, that person has got completely lost in all of the, the connections and the relationships. So it sometimes can get very hard. You get bogged down in the complexity. This and these frameworks is really about trying to lift you back out and say, what's going on here? You know, are we, if something's not working, are we clear on the what? Have we got the right people? Do we need to bring others in? And where are we in the process? So principles, some key components to think about, and what I'd now to now think about is actually, in more detail, is actually the process. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the what and the who at this stage. So that's the critical components of partnering. And if you look at my wonderful magical partnering process, three stages. This partnering process, would you believe, actually was developed um, out of amalgamating councils in South Australia, where I was involved or had the, the task of, as I was a CEO in government, dragged offline to, and told by government, go and amalgamate councils, Ian, we want half the number of councils in 12 months, and by the way, we want it voluntarily. Can you do it, please? And that was my writing orders. Um, we actually achieved it. We went from 118 to 69 councils in 12 months through a massive facilitated process. Um, working closely with local government association, uh, government ourselves, um, but we developed a process where we effectively took it out of government and we ran this independent process. We, and I didn't know it at the time and I didn't call it partnering, but it was effectively a partnering process. Um, and it was a three-stage process, not these names. I've developed it a lot more since, but we had an early creating stage, you know, the foundation stage. We then had a developing stage and then a sustaining stage. And just to think about this in more detail, and I'm going to give you a little exercise in a moment on this as well. To think about, if you think about the creating stage, this is all about the what and the who, if we drag it back to those components I mentioned a minute ago. So in the early stage creating, it's really fundamentally about what, trying to get some conversation, building trust, building relationships, but getting some fundamental agreement on the what and who needs to be involved. At the end of that, you may end up with a partnering agreement, which sets down some of the principles, sets down some of the you know, ways that you want to work together in a general sense. The developing stage is all about how we're going to deliver. Okay? That's about actually getting stuff happening. So this is the strategic bit. This is the big sky thinking. This is the, the big picture thinking. 
This is more where we get it happening on the ground, operationalising it, taking the big ideas and making it happen. And then of course we've got the sustaining stage, which is all about the where to. How are we going to keep it going? How are we going to keep this thing, whoops, how are we going to keep it operating over a number of years and actually continuing to deliver a return on investment over that period of time? Because many of those, if you're investing in a relationship um, and taking the time to get into one of these integrated type relationships, um, if you're investing all that time, it's not a six month exercise, is it? You're going to be looking at probably a longer term. It could be two, three, five years, it could be 10, 15 years. So you want to get the foundations right and you want to move through it. So that's a simple three stage process. The reason um, I often recite the exercise that there's no magical 55 steps, you know, if you go through every step you'll end up with a perfect partnership at the end of the day. Um, that's why this is meant to be a broad framework, okay? There's an early stage, developing stage, and then the long midterm, and then there's the long term stage. And it's a matter of how you work through that. One of the key success factors I would encourage you to think about is that the critical thing is what questions you ask at what stage of the process. So in the early stages, what questions do you need to ask of yourself and your potential partners? When you get to the developing stage, what questions do you need to ask about delivery and actually doing the stuff, accountability? And then in the future, what sort of questions do you need to ask there? So thinking about the different stages. What this is all about is trying to actually, um, I call it partnering by design, okay? It's being proactive. It's actually going through some steps and stages because we know, you know, this is how it rolls out over a period of time. So many times over the years we see partnering and partnerships just go ad hoc, you know? Just, oh well, we'll have a meeting and we'll see where it goes and then we'll go to the next one. There is actually a bit of structure you can put to it. And quite frankly, the whole reason I'm still doing this is really to encourage people to put more rigour into the process. To think carefully about when to partner, when it's going to add value. Do it when you think you can, but when you do it, do it properly. Try and do it the best you possibly can. Um, and really go through the checks and balances. And if it's not delivering, forget it. Go and do something else. Go back to the traditional model. But be very careful. The more you know about this, what I'd say is the, the better it will be and the easier it will be for you to decide when to partner in this way and when to do a traditional business model. Okay, so that's what I'm really trying to encourage you to think about. Now, what I really want you to think about is what do you think are the key activities and questions at each of these stages? So you're not going to get off lightly by just listening to me espouse the perfect world of partnering up here. Um, what I'd like you to do now is actually practically sit at the tables and actually start to work out and say, okay, some of you are going through a, a process this afternoon. You're going to be sitting down very much in that right at the start, in this creating phase. Someone's called a meeting. What are the questions we need to ask? What are the activities? What are the sort of things that we should think we need to do here? And then work it through. So I'm going to give you a bit of time, 15 minutes or so, to think about this. I think it's really fundamentally important and at the end I'll show you a slide which is some of the things I've got. Um, okay, let, let's do some of the activities. So what are the things that the, we think you need to do in the creating stage? What are some of the things that need to happen at that stage? Define the opportunity. Okay? The first one. Okay? And purpose, yeah, and what will come out of that. Define the opportunity, come up with a purpose. Define the problem, excellent. You know, really getting to the core of what the problem is and getting common agreement on the actual problem itself. Can you, uh, beg your pardon? Can you actually address it? Can you actually address the problem? Have you got the, and then it'll lead to, well, have you got the right people in the room to actually address that particular problem? Because how many times have you gone to a meeting thinking it was about one thing and ended up being about something totally different? Uh, or you're coming away with a different understanding of a particular issue? Absolutely. Sorry, can just hang on. We'll just move the mic around if I can just ask for our online participants um, as well. So we're talking about before this, you need like a mandate or agenda so everybody's on the same page as well the, as part of the creating. So a mandate and a... And like, a what's mandate? Yeah, what's the mandate for why we're doing it? Yeah, why are we, why are we actually yeah. doing it? You know, so what's the, 
the opportunity. I think that sort of leads a little bit from defining the opportunity, but the first question before that is why do it? I think that was a conversation you guys were having. Uh, why would you want to do this? You know, defining what it is. But if you define the problem, you know, and actually focus on getting some common agreement on what the problem is, that may then help you define the opportunity that could come out of it, wouldn't it, in terms of a bit more clarity? Um, okay. And often the mandate's interesting, why do it? Um, also, uh, are people authorised to come along and have those sort of conversations? You know, what's the authorising environment, you call it? Sorry to use management speak, but you know what I mean? Like, are people able to come and have these discussions? Um, have the authority to speak at the table. So what else would have to happen? What other sort of activity would have to happen at the, at the start? Sorry? This. What resources do you what have? What resources have? Now that's an interesting one. Would you do that right at the start, do you think? Sorry, just Janelle. Sorry if we can just grab the mic again. If you haven't got the resources to um, define or contribute to the problem, address the problem, then you may as well not make, go further. I guess the, the challenge I'd put to you there is that if you jump too much to, to some of those issues about resources and who's putting what in, etc., before you've defined the problem, before you've actually um, you know, developed the opportunity to a stage, agreed on the problem, <coughs> defined the opportunity, etc., you might want to talk broadly about resources, but the actual detail can I suggest would come later in the developing stage. That's once you've agreed to do something. But you, you obviously need to have some general conversations. That's the issue always about funding. I was talking to the table over here about one of the things I always suggest is that try and leave funding out of the conversations in the early stages. Because if you're in the creating stage and you try and, or the conversation starts to head around dollars and who's getting what and funding, et cetera, it's what I get the, I call the funding dynamic. It can steer you down a particular direction and as we said over there, it stifles innovation, creativity, it's all about the money. Who's getting what slice of the cake? So I'd really encourage you to leave, a bit, leave funding till later on. You might have some general conversations, but when we get to the detail of funding, that probably needs to come later on. Yes, Keith. Creating stage, um, identifying stakeholders, so kind of calling out uh, to interested parties. Yep. Um, and then potentially further looking at the peripheral of that, who else might have a vested interest in being involved? Exactly, yep. Finding out the, the scope out there. And it's interesting with that. Um, I'll show you a little diagram later. I, it's called fan focus, where often I encourage people to fan out um, and do exactly that, see who the stakeholders are and who's out there. But often what can happen is that we tend to go with who we know. <laughs> you know, we shortcut the, the circuit. Um, and it was interesting, was it you, Janelle, talking about the, you were getting involved in, with a particular organisation and suddenly found out they had 120 stores or you know, supply agreements back in Australia already, you know, just through that conversation. So great, excellent. Anything else on, on process, the creating stage? Hang on, we've got one at the back, John. Oh, it's just a comment online from George Ainsley, Ainsley Agroforestry and Aquaponics. He's just commented, more of a comment than a question. Well, they've already created a test product, which is to undergo tests for value adding. Um, and those tests have been completed hopefully in late September and we, they'll have a sample product to deliver. Then they will have to de develop it for the larger scale market, so scaling up. And this will definitely involve the sit down with collaborative partners for long term growth. So that's a scaling up issue. A scaling up. Yep. I think it's in the Midwest or Geraldton? In Geraldton, I think it is. Okay. So just in terms of fitting into this conversation then, so he's saying an activity might be talking about the opportunity again about scaling up, correct? John, you know, that that could be another opportunity or an option that could come out of it. Okay, let's just move to developing now. Okay, so if we talked about that early stage, it's really about scoping, um, finding out what this opportunity is, what would be the next stage developing, do you think? I mean, I gave you a bit of a hint before. This is a test to see who was listening. Right. Sorry? Process. Process, yep. We're actually, how are we going to get there? So we've got all of that, we've got an agreement at the end of this, we're agreed to, yep, we're going to form a group, we're going to partner, or whether it's two companies or more or whatever. We're getting to the developing stage. Okay, so how are we going to go forward? So what are the sorts of things we might need to agree at that stage, do you think? Structure, yeah, how are we going to manage this? How are we going to coordinate it? Communication. Janelle? Communication. 
communication, how you're going to work together both internally and externally. Exactly. How is the nitty gritty? How is it actually going to happen on a day to day basis? Um, you know. And one of the things which may result, may fit under creating and developing is that you may be in a position where you need some formal agreement of commercial and confidence agreement. Exactly. Depending yep. on the situation. It's interesting. The, um, often at this stage, the end of between creating and developing, there may be the opportunity there to form a broad general partnering agreement. And a partnering agreement can actually be a non-legally binding agreement, right? But there can actually be some clauses that are legal. And in fact, that company, that uh, particular relationship I talked about with Sage Automation and SeaTech in New Zealand, they created an MOU which said specifically, this is a non-legal agreement except for clauses eight, nine, and 10. And one was about intellectual property, commercial and confidence, and confidentiality, I think, the three clauses. Interestingly, they called it their best friends agreement and they had one lawyer draw it up, which I thought, I wasn't involved in that, I thought it was really innovative and I use it as an example in my training now. Um, but that was two companies that were, had the right mindset about how we want to work together and they, the best friends analogy I think actually really encapsulates what they saw as their relationship um, and how they wanted it to continue. Yes? Um, in that developing stage, bringing in the resources um, that you don't have in that business or in that partnership agreement, identifying exactly. them and bringing them in. Identifying and, and bringing in the resources, the contributions that you actually need to, to do what you need to do, absolutely. And it may be within the core partners, or as I said, it may be from external other groups that you just contract in. Okay, what about now if we go to sustaining? Just. What are some of the things you might want to consider at that stage? Yes. Um, do a review. Is it working for all parties involved? Exactly. Review, evaluating and reviewing. And importantly, if you're doing evaluating and reviewing, when should you first talk about evaluating and reviewing, do you think? Um, I'd actually be putting it in in that developing stage, you know, have your communications plan, you know, when are we going to review, how often we meet, some of those basic principles of the actual um, partnership. Can I actually encourage you and say, I'd even get you to have the conversations right up here in the creating stage, okay? And the reason being, it's a lot easier to have those conversations about evaluating and reviewing then, than when you get so far down into a relationship and suddenly you think one of the partners isn't really doing what they said they were going to do. And you might think, I know how we'll fix this, we'll have a review. But it's pretty targeted, isn't it, at that stage? You know, it's pretty obvious why you want a review. So the earlier you can discuss some of these things without there being any, you know, issue that needs to be resolved is actually easier. You know, so I really encourage, um, in fact, people said to me, um, often in various initiatives, how do we create sustainable partnerships? And I said, well, it's like a building, isn't it? And I'm a civil engineer by training, so fundamentally I look at the foundations and getting that in place. If you want to be working over there and sustaining, sorry for pointing that way, Nikki, at you, um, it's actually about getting the foundations right. And often what happens is that because we all like to do stuff, and I know in a small business we all want to get out there and do stuff, we don't want to sit having endless conversations up here. We just want to get there and get it done and move on because you know we're action orientated. We've got to get a return. We tend to jump to here. We tend to jump to doing the stuff, to the tasks. Let's get a let's get a group together. Yeah, we'll get a this afternoon. You could come out of it. You could define your structure. You set a process. Yep, we're going to do this. We're going to set three tasks. And we're going to go and do it. And we haven't even talked about how we're going to work together or what the relationship. Can I just suggest to you that if you jump too quickly there, it might be the old one step forward, two steps back. Because you might find you get there and then all of a sudden you need to revisit some of the fundamentals. So spending enough time here, getting the relationships in place, building the trust, foundations at that stage, and getting sure about some honesty and authenticity amongst the partners before you get into the nitty gritty of actually committing resources. Because this is where the rubber hits the road, basically. And of course, sustaining evaluation review. What else might happen in evaluation review? Sorry, Jenna, were you, did you want to make a? 
I comment about what I just said? Uh, it just um, our group concentrated a lot on the fact that there did need to be um, partnerships that were based on a relationship and that the relationship needed to have a good personal value and moral base right. so that they could move forward with the developing and sustaining. And if it wasn't there, it probably wouldn't go yeah. forward. So getting a very clear basis, and that's in the principles, the values base of the organisation. If your values don't match, no. you're not going to go anywhere. And also, just in terms of that sustaining, um, that you need to measure the outcomes and outputs. If you're going to grow hugely, you may need to, somewhere along the line, get extra funding for that growth that yep. you hadn't identified earlier. Yep. yep. So it's like a cycle. It's like a development cycle. And it's actually a partnership life cycle. So you start off in the early stages. I haven't got whiteboard to draw on, but if you can just visualise, um, we're starting off here, you know, having lots of conversations, we're not delivering much. When you start to move to the developing stage, actually I'll do it with a, another colour pen. Creating, developing, so say we've got a graph here, we start off down here, and then we start, as we get to developing, we're starting to deliver, but then as we get to sustaining, we start to mature. And what happens when businesses mature? All right. They can either regenerate and grow or they can die, right? You know, you need to continue a certain amount of growth or you can just disappear. So what else needs to happen up in this area? Yes, we need to evaluate and review, but what's the other, what's the key question? I'll jump to that now that needs to be asked at this stage. Do you think? Profitability. Profitability? Well, that comes on the evaluation review, doesn't it? Evaluation, are you achieving what you set out? Yep. Equity, but what's another fundamental issue that you need to decide when you're getting to that stage? Uh, future vision. Future vision. What's the future? Has the partnership actually lived its life cycle? You know, or do we need to regenerate, or do we move on? There are many relationships, might I say, sorry, that um, that what happens is that they start off. In this case, they build a lovely relationship, and then they keep going, but they don't want it to stop but they're not actually delivering anything. You know, they've actually delivered what they set out to and then by that stage it's fading. So you just need to be very careful that as you go through this process, you start off with high task, low relationship, you end up with high relationship, low task if you're not careful. So knowing when to stop a partnering arrangement is as important as knowing when to start it uh, and how you go. I think we might move on quickly. How are we going for time? How about we just, thank you very much. I'll just, that's great. Okay, thank you. Let's just think of some of the questions now, and I won't write them up on the board, but just going back to these three stages. Having heard those activities, what are some of the key questions, the fundamental questions that you might ask at this early stage? If you're engaging with other partners even. Got any ideas, thoughts? No? What do we want? Why? Yes. Why are we doing this? The other thing, what do we know about the others? You know, you're sitting down this afternoon with other brewers. What do you actually know about them? What do you know about their businesses? What are you prepared to share? You know? Are we better together? You know? Where's the alignment? You know? So it's, it, that's what I'm trying to get to. You know, that these are activities, but if I can encourage you to think about the questions that you need to ask at each stage. There's a couple of white papers up there, um, just simple ones, they're free downloads on my website as well. They go through some of the activities and some of the key questions, so you might find that useful as well, just as a snapshot. So I won't prolong this conversation in going through it. It outlines that, but the whole purpose of what I was trying to get to is that there are defined activities that need to happen in a partnering process, and we know what they are. You know, we've done enough of this now that they're the sorts of things that need to happen at each stage. So you've got a roadmap in terms of how to go forward, and there are certain questions that you need to fundamentally ask at each stage. Um, and if you're armed with that information, that'll make it so much easier when you're engaging with others. Because just um, as a reflection, often what we can do is we get caught up in our own content. Right? You're all experts in your own area, you know, whether it's breweries or other food distribution or grape, drying grapes, that's your expertise. Right? Um, so it's very easy to hook back into the content and the issues, but sometimes if I can encourage you to think about what's the process, what's actually going on here, how are we actually relating and how are we moving through this might help you navigate a little a better path as you go forward. 
So, I hope you found that useful in just thinking about the process and for those particularly about to embark on a partnering process that it might give you some ideas. And this is the, when you actually go to the white paper, this is the list of activities here. And you can see there's stuff like setting milestones, engaging expertise, capacity building of partners in the developing stage. Not all partners may have the same understanding. You might know all about partnering, but they don't. So how can you help them come up to a certain level? Um, and I think most of, the, most of the areas you picked up pretty well in going through that, so that's great. So the other critical thing is that's all wonderful, it's fantastic, but how do you actually get results? How do you actually get action from this? So can I just ask, what are those birds doing? Pretty obvious. What are they doing? They're sitting on a fence. Right. Have you ever been to a, asked to come to a meeting? Right. Someone has called you up and said, hey, we'd like to meet with you. We'd like to talk about X, Y, or Z. You know? We've got a proposition we want to put in front of you. And you go to that meeting. And have you ever felt like you're just kind of sitting on the fence? You don't want to actually... You're engaged, but you're not actually committing to anything at this stage. Okay? This is what often happens at a meeting. If you have a partnering opportunity or an idea and want to try and get a group together, if you want to try and engage with somebody, often what can happen is, remember, it's your idea. You're the only one partnering at the moment. It's likely the, the other partners are sitting on the fence. So we hear a lot this term engagement. We hear it everywhere. Oh, you've got to get engaged. But the question is, is engagement enough? And I'd put it to you that it's not. That you actually need to move to developing, which is commitment, Right? So we're building engagement here, we're getting development, is getting commitment, where people are delivering resources, and when you get to this stage, is actually all about ownership. All of the partners need to own it. As a simple analogy, this is about mindset shift. All of you are probably involved in sport in some way. Would that be a fair comment? Local community sport, or have been over the years? Have many of you been asked to, um, by a friend to come and join a club, you know, come out and play tennis or play footy or play netball or whatever? Any of you have been asked in that situation? You know, you're not a member of or, or connected with a club, but they ask you to come out, okay? And you say, oh, okay, I might, uh, I might give that a go, okay? Yep, I'll come and try it. So you go out and try it a few times. Where are you? You're engaged enough to come out and actually have a go and to try it. And then someday, uh, sometime, they come along and say, actually, um, it's great you've been coming out a few times. Would you like to become a member of the club? Now, this involves commitment. Right? So what has to shift in your head? You have to go from being engaged, you know, like just having a, a hit, no obligation, I can go out there whenever I want to, to like actually joining the club, being committed. So that actually, it requires a mindset shift, doesn't it, in your head to say, yeah, I want to now be more a part of this. I want to really get involved. I'm going to be, I'll, feel, I'll, I'll comply with the rules of the club and, and participate. And likewise, if you've been a member and someone says, hey, how about you come along and join the committee? You know, we've got an AGM on. I'm sure everyone in this room has been asked to be on an AGM, you know, or a committee at something at some stage. What does it take for you to go from being a member to being on the committee. That's, sorry? People that hate you. <laughs> but it requires a different level of commitment, doesn't it? It requires a sense of ownership of that club, that you really want to be a part of that and you want it to continue in some way, okay? I guess I'm just using that as a simple analogy that as, you as you're going part the, through this partnering process, it's fine to go through all the steps, but unless you can bring people on the journey to go from initial engagement to a sense of commitment, to really everybody owning it and feeling a part of it, I'd suggest you're not going to get the full results, you're not going to get the action that you actually really desire. So that's what I call the ECOA principle, okay? Engagement, commitment, plus commitment, plus ownership gives you the action, gives you the outcome. And I think we often fall short. We think we've got engagement and we think, oh, that's good enough? No. There's more that's required. And as I said to a couple of people around the table, building partnerships is a very much a step-by-step -step process. And this is meant to illustrate that as, if you start 
wide apart, you almost need to take little steps up and as you take little steps forward, you come closer together and again you come closer together. So just imagine you're in, on different stairways and there could be three or four stairways, but you're all trying to bring people up together. If one organisation gets too far ahead of the other, what happens? You get unstable and it can fall over. So actually getting everybody to the starting gate at the start of a process and then all working through the process together is absolutely critical. And there's a little saying I often use that you only move as fast as the slowest partner. So if you're trying to work with another organisation and they've got a whole lot of bureaucracy or stuff going on and you can't get decisions but you're there, you know, wanting to move, let's get on, let's do it, you know, there's going to be a lot of frustration build up. So a step-by-step -step process as you go through it. Take the time, go through the process and ask the questions that you need to ask very thoroughly. Just don't jump too quickly. And in this early stage, to me it's a lot about discussion and not so much about quick decisions. If you feel you've got to make a decision, you're jumping into developing too much, probably. Okay, what I'd like to do now is just show you another little video. Partnering as a strategy, where a question was put to Marie Picconi about did she just stumble into to partnering or not. The other major learning is that, for me, is that the value chain the value chain management plan is, um, management is, for us, it really suits the way we want to do business. It really suits one way. It's that the five key elements, they're so important. Relationships, you'll live through nearly anything if you've got a strong relationship in export markets with the people that matter. Um, consumer insights are just key. We really understand a lot more than we ever did and that's made us better at doing business. Um, efficiency, effectiveness, because we're a, high, we're a high cost nation and we have to be as efficient and effective as, um, yeah, and communication. You have to, I believe you have to have respect, be open, be honest, um, and uh, completely be a big listener. Big li we're, we're, we try to be big listeners. I was interested in some of your comments before about how um, you've done stuff around collaboration and how that's worked. But the more, more information would be great. Did you just stumble into this, or um, how did you make this sort of thing happen? Stumble into the collaboration? Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of it's fortuitous, and but whatever. But um, for, for, for us, we try to get along and be good industry, um, good industry members, but we're pretty particular about who we would actually collaborate with. So you have to ha be you have to be ethically aligned, and you have to, I believe, be very clear about what you're trying to achieve. And in the early days of exporting, we were really keen to bring a whole lot of other growers in and bring their produce in. But the objectives were different. So there's two growers that we get product from for export. Um, they don't let us down. Their quality is um, um, better than acceptable to very good, depending on what the conditions are. Um, they are committed, and that's why they don't let us down, and, um, and they're realistic. There's some uh, pretty strong reinforcement of some of the, the comments, you know, the commitment coming through. Um, it wasn't just something that was ad hoc, you know, there was some definite thinking behind it and some strategy behind it in terms of how she progressed through the process. So um, just little gems of, of comments that I think reflect on some of the ideas from a really practical situation in your sector and how it works in practice. Any questions on any of that? Any questions on any of the information so far about that process and getting engagement. I know we're kind of getting into a bit of theory, but um, hopefully if you reflect and take it into your own context and where you are in the process, it might help. Just raise a few questions. And even if it raises just one or two questions for you and you ask things a different way, that could add a lot of value to you in your process. Yes, Serge. Um, just thinking about, like, what's the sort of the time frame in your experience with all these partnerships, I know it depends on whether they're small businesses or big businesses, yeah. et cetera, but it sounds like this is a fragile process. Like, to, you know, say the creating stage, would it just be one meeting, 50 meetings? Okay. You know, is it going back and forth until you've reached 
clear objectives or, you know, so, sometimes you might need to move quickly in the market. There might be a gap there. You might need to move yep. quickly. I mean, in your experience, what's, yeah, how long do these things take? Are they very tedious? I can give you a really good example, um, an example of where we did go through this process. Uh, it's a mining company, Oz Minerals, and, and uh, Cooker Aboriginal Group, and it was around the Carapatina Mine, which is a billion dollar mine north of South Australia. Um, Olympic Dam is in one area, and this mine is a, you know, several hundred kilometres away, but it's the same Aboriginal group. Um, the group actually took about five years to negotiate with BHP, right, at that stage not through this process. With Oz Minerals, we got a partnering agreement within three months and we had a native title agreement sewn up in 12 months. But there were some interesting things. The way that started was there was a three-day meeting on site. All of the executive of Oz Minerals and all of the executive from that Aboriginal group sat down for a three-day workshop which I facilitated. And you know what the focus of that three days was about? It was about sharing information. No decision to be made, but it was about sharing, trying to build trust, it was trying to learn from each other, it was understanding. It's all the stuff about creating the foundation, um, sharing of information about what is this project, you know, etc. Lots of sharing, lots of openness, um, and often being open. Like, and as I said, trust builds dramatically, and that provided the foundation step. And from that first three days, they said, well, how do we start this process? And I said, well, there's a number of options, and one of them was a partnering agreement. Uh, and going through that process, and I said, and they said, oh, why don't you go away and do one for us? And I said, I'm not writing a partnering agreement for you. I can help you with a framework and I can help you with some of the headings, but it has to be your words and you have to own it and go through the process. So what happened is we had, through that 12 months, there were some large group meetings, about three, but in between there was a smaller group, a core group that would go away and meet every three or four weeks and progress the discussion. So a negotiating group basically. Uh, but interestingly what happened is that um, the, they made a decision to keep the lawyers out of it until the end. Okay, so it was independently facilitated by myself and it was all about the people and getting together and building the relationships and building the trust and sharing and working through the issues. Um, and then later on, the lawyers were brought in to actually draft the legal agreement which they needed to get mining approval. So that was a massive one. So that took one year. Right? And this is all documented. There's articles on it uh, on my website, but also Oz IMM. Uh, the process is all laid out. Now they didn't know they were going through a process. I didn't actually sit down with them and say, we're gonna do creating and then we're gonna do developing and then we're gonna do sustaining and we're gonna ask these questions and these are the activities. I just fed it into the process, okay? We just went through it and I worked with one of their people in terms of designing it and worked through it um, and we got there through that process. So that's one example. One way of the, the getting quickly there, what I'd suggest to you is that the more you know about who's out there, the stakeholders at the moment, before a partnering opportunity comes up. If you've got relationships, good relationships with a whole network, you then can say, oh, who do I need to bring? Right, okay, you three, let's get together and work on that. If you've had some of that preliminary stuff without an opportunity, like even this, uh, if you do some brewery get together, you may not decide to do anything, but if you learn more about each other, there could be a really good opportunity that comes up in six months time. That you know, you think, oh, right, we're ready to pounce now, we can do it, you know, get in there, we know how to and process, okay? So hopefully that's an idea, but you're right, it's very context, every partnering situation is context specific. Just because it worked there doesn't mean to say it's going to work here. People are different, situations different. Um, but hopefully, I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you put a bit of process step in it, you can move a lot faster. And I'm all about doing it quick, fast, you know, learning, um, do it quickly, um, effectively, and getting some results. You know? Okay. Do you think, in your example you've just given, it helped having the decision makers in the room? Uh, that po at particular time, absolutely. Yep. Um, they, that was to set the scene, okay, at that very much the executive level. Uh, and in fact, one of the um, key elements of the partnering agreement, they decided to set up a partnering management committee to oversee the partnering agreement. And they actually embedded that into the actual contractual agreement as well. And what they said themselves, I didn't suggest it, they came up and said, oh, we're not going to have any proxies, okay? If it's the general manager operations uh, that's uh, designated, that person will be there face to face, okay? Now, obviously, COVID's created some issues, but they actually said it themselves that we weren't going to defer this because one of the signs of a partnership not working well is when the initial group or, you know, the key people that are meant to be there say, oh, look, sorry, I can't make it this week. You know, look, I'd love to be there, but look, you know, someone else is coming or I just can't make it. That's, that's a red flag, you know, that's a bit like, hang on, 
Are they serious about this? Are they committed? Are they owning it? So yeah, so there's lots of nuances here. Yes, Ian, John. Ian, I've just got a question about the term partnering. We're, we're actually entering into a collaboration agreement with Southern Dirt for a conference on the 23rd of September. <laughs> People are interested, a bit of a plug, plug there. Plug. Um, and I put it up to our legal guys and they said, could you please not use the word partnering yep. because it has legal ramifications in terms of the Corporations Act. It's actually a, a formal partnership, so I took that out. The question is, is do, do you, and we hear other words like collective, I think there's the Caves Road Collective, there's associations, there's networking, there's clustering. Is there I any issues, do you think, with the word partnership? Should it be avoided? Think, um, is it too legal or should you start off with a network? Or I'd suggest you talk to your lawyers first about, is it the word partnership or partnering? Partnership, you will find, you know, there was always clauses in contracts saying this in no way denotes a partnership or blah, 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 blah. I talk about partnering, which is the process of working together, right, the how-to. Can I tell you, I don't care what you call it. You know, you can call it Humpty Dumpty if you want to. The most important thing is that the partners, the people sitting around the table, know what it is. Um, I chaired the native title process in state of Australia for nine years, right? Farmers Federation with all the pastoralists, mining industry, local government, state government, 24 native title groups, um, federal government observers. We were the alternative, my organisation, to the native title tribunal. So I chaired that process and ran it with about six or eight people over about nine years. And we had a meeting protocol. And that was developed out of the first meeting where the key decision makers were there. They developed the words. That meeting protocol was voluntary, it wasn't legally binding, but it, kept, it was updated regularly and kept there. That was the glue that held it together. And this was all about creating indigenous land use agreements for pastoral, parks, fishing, whatever of which we created masses in South Australia. So it was an alternative process. So get back to your point, you can call it what you like. Um, SAGE and CTEC had an MOU. Um, you know, Oz Minerals decided to call it a partnering agreement. Um, they didn't worry about the legal terms, you know. Interestingly, where we often get caught, where we often get caught is people say, well, how do partnering agreements sit with contracts? Because I've actually gone back, you know, Oz, we might not, no, a bit of a, no, I, I can say this, I think. Um, if you've got a major organisation that is pretty well contract based, but they want to do partnering, the issue is often, well, how does the partnering bit fit with the contract bit? You know? And they can sit side by side, or the partnering agreement could be the foundation, right? Or the over, overview, right? That's the way we work together. And then you have a series of contracts, which is all about the delivery. For example, um, having done a lot of work, work in the APY lands, you know, where there was a regional partnership between federal government, state government, the Aboriginal leaders, okay? An overarching partnering agreement, but there was, below that we had a number of agreements around caring to country or youth, um, you know, tackling drugs and issues, etc. You know, so they could be contract program delivery things. So you can work this out, but the way you work it out is that um, the partners, or potential partners sitting down and having the right conversations. In fact, in, in, commercial, in commercial agreements, I've used the word term sheet to start with. Yeah. So it's just a term sheet which you disagree on, and then you end up having a legal agreement from yeah. that. Yeah. So you know, you. Um, but I think, look, don't get hung up with language. I mean, I'm talking about partnering. You know, I'm, I'm promoting the perfect world of partnering. Uh, I'm very aware of the fact that this is not your reality necessarily. You know, it's bloody hard stuff. Um, the question you need to ask is, is going down a different path and a different ways, different types of relationship going to be better than continuing business as usual? Okay? Is there something in it? And is it worth exploring you know, down a particular path? And if it is, well then there's some processes and some ways that you can go about it and hopefully some tools out there that you can actually you know, get back to. Uh, but yeah, all those sorts of questions. I actually advise getting lawyers involved early in conversations if it's a really complex one. Uh, getting them at the table. In fact, um, working with World Vision, running advanced partnering programs, we actually had their lawyers as part of the training programs. And they had a different, because lawyers are trained in adversarial ways of working. Um, it takes particular lawyers with a different mindset again to be able to work in this collaborative space. Okay, any other questions on that at all before we move on? 
hopefully I'm leaving you a few things just to think about in the, in the time ahead. Okay, so let's talk about getting started. If, any of you, if, if I haven't put you off completely about the idea of partnering, and any of you now feel like you want to get started, particularly that group this afternoon, um, these are just some of the, and I'll just run through these slides and, and give you some, some tips on it. Um, things that you could ask yourself, are we actually ready to partner? You know, have we got the time? Have we got the capability? Do we understand enough to get there? What value can we see? Getting back to that why question again, why would we not want to do it? Who needs to be involved? What do we know about the others? Just because you get six or nine or ten brewers together, do you know anything about each other? I mean, you're all competitors potentially, I suppose. Could be. Hopefully you all talk nicely. Um, but what do you know about them really? What do you know about their business direction and how they might work together? Does it align with yours? And the other thing is what support do you need? You know, um, do you need some other support in actually doing it uh, to create the space? It may be a resource. Um, do you need to go knocking on Deep Herd's door? Because you know? they love helping, don't you John? Yep. <laughs> well, that's right, always. <laughs> I think, no, I won't say it. I was in government for many years. <laughs> I've been in my own business for 20 plus years. So. Um, okay, assessing potential partners. Just some things to think about. And this was brought up earlier. I think it might have been you, Serge, that talked. What is the role of the organisation? Are they financially viable? You know? Are they a credible organisation? Are they going to be there in six or 12 months' time? Have they a good reputation? It gets back to values. What could they bring? You know? What are some of the things that they could bring along? And do their values align? I mean, all of these things we've talked about this morning, haven't we? They've all, been, they've all come up. And would they see value in getting involved? This gets back to a lot of the value proposition. What's in it for you and what's in it for them? And if they can't identify a value proposition and you can't identify one, I'd suggest you're not going to get very far. No? I don't know if I can print these off. If the group wants them this afternoon, I can probably get copies of this or Nikki might be able to get copies. Okay, Email them out or whatever. Yep. Um, assessing potential partners. The other thing is, do they have sound governance and management structures in place? You know, so that's another thing about understanding and learning about the other potential partners. You know, so how do they operate? And I wouldn't be afraid of asking questions, so how do you go about doing that? And, and how's your business operated? And, and how do you run? You know, are you owned by some international you know, conglomerate you know, who actually pulls the strings from Europe and tells you actually what to do and what not to do? So how empowered, how much authority are you going to have at the table to actually say yes or no? Do their staff have knowledge and experience in partnering? Have they ever been involved in this before? Have they, do they know about you know, some of these things? And do they have the capacity, do they have the time to actually commit to sitting down the conversations? I actually talk about this often and saying that at the start in that creating phase, do you know anybody at the moment that isn't 120% busy? Do you know anybody who's got spare time? Anybody? You've got, you mean you, there's no one in this room that's got spare time? You're always, you're all flat out? So where's partnering going to fit in? You're all fully committed. And in that early stage, the creating or engagement phase, fine, you can find a bit of space to go to some early meetings, as people are this afternoon, right? Go to that. But once you start to get into that and get into there, what has to happen? Any thoughts? Sorry? You have to have capacity. It's got to become part of core business, right? It's not an add-on. It starts off as an add-on, but you're right, it needs to be core business for either the people sitting at the table or resources need to be found to take it forward. Beg your pardon? Sorry, just hang on, we'll get a microphone for the people that are online. Sorry, Janelle. Yep. You build your capacity and you resource allocate so that you make that time. Yep. You can, but in some situations you might need to bring others. But yes, you need, to, you need to say, okay, if this is really important, it's core business, right? This is now part of what we're doing. If it stays as an add-on, what's going to happen? It'll get flicked off like lots of other stuff, you know? So um, do they have the capacity? And these are the sorts of questions I'd encourage you to ask of the other partners. So if we started and went down this process, have you guys got the time to be involved in this? I mean, that's a reasonable enough question. Um, 
how much time can you commit to this? It's a fairly innocuous question, but it could actually, if someone says, well, actually, I can't give a time, I can meet again in four months' time, you might say, well, see you later. <laughs> you know? So think about it in terms of assessing partners. And just some tips. At the start, and I can't stress this any more than I can now, everyone at the start feels very uncertain. So if you go into that meeting, any meetings where you've been asked to come to a first meeting, except the fact you probably feel uncertain about, well, how am I going to go about this? And I mean, I felt uncertain about coming here today. You probably did. I've given this presentation hundreds of times, okay, all around the country, and yet I still get a bit nervous and a bit like, oh, well, how's because this is a different context, a different situation, different group, different sector than I've worked in for a long time. So how are you going to, you know, so there's a level of uncertainty. You're probably a bit uncertain about, well, okay, what's this about? You know, am I going to spend my time? Am I going to waste my time? You know, exactly the same applies in a context of, of partnering. Everybody's uncertain. Can I suggest you need to really focus on sharing information early on? Sharing learning, information, as much, learning as much as possible about each other. That's non-threatening. That's just sharing. And it builds and build a foundation of trust. I often talk about this expression or thought about um, a trust bank. And I'll, I'll just um, quickly rub this out. Hopefully you took a photo of that, Nikki. Yep, so you can type it down? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Is that the one? Yeah. Yep, okay. Um, at the, um, the start of relationships, we're down here. If we talk about um, the level of trust on the side there, and we talk about time here, we start off with kind of zero. We may start off with pretty zero trust down here. And we've kind of got to build trust over a short period of time. And to me, you need to build a trust bank, which is a foundation of trust, so that as the partnership goes up and down, and inevitably you will have your ups and downs, you've got a base of trust to fall back on. You know, it's a trust bank. Um, if you have no foundation of trust there, an issue comes up and everybody walks, okay? But, and I'm sure you've all been in these situations, personally or otherwise, where you know, you've gone through tough times with a relationship in one way or another. But if there's enough of a trust foundation there, it holds you enough together to say, OK, I'll come back and let's talk again or let's work it through the issues, etc. It's no different in a partnership. Can I move on now, Claire? Thank you. OK. And oh, the last one there, don't be afraid to ask lots of questions. And yeah, I just keep asking questions. Getting lift off. Remember earlier I talked about one partner might have a lot of capacity and capability. They may know how to do this stuff. And then you want to go and meet or work with other organisations that haven't. Well, imagine we're in a helicopter and each blade is a partner. And the strength of that blade is their capability and their capacity, right? So are they a strong partner? If you have one strong partner and two weak partners, you're not going to get off the ground, all right? That partnership blade is just going to spin. So you could be in a fantastic position, think you've got a great idea about partnering, you know all about it, you want to do something, and yet the organisations you're going and talk to haven't got the time, capacity, or know anything about it. And you've got to ask the question, are we going to get anywhere with this, you know? Uh, so it could be a great idea, but it's the wrong time or wrong partners. So just have a think about that. I mean, that's, I think, a, a great little metaphor for thinking about we want the partnership to lift off. We've all got to be at a certain level of capability. And a sign of maturity in partnering is if one partner senses that another partner is struggling, they help out. You know, how can you support? How can you help to lift the others up? Because it's going to be good for all of you. Now, what I would like to show you is a really interesting little four-minute segment um, from Mark Hayward, the owner of Dingley Dell Pork in the UK, and this is about finding the right partner. So we're nearly at the end, but this is a, a good little summary of some of the key points and his journey, which he summarises in terms of um, particularly starting off trying to find a partnership and then where it ended up. So let's have a look at this. The very first meeting I had 
when I started Dingley Love, I went to see a processor and I, and I, I did, my branding was nowhere near what it is now. I went to see this guy and I said, look, I've got this idea. He was a, he was a bacon manufacturer in Ham. I said, look, let's work together and we'll, you know, we're going to have this brand and we're going to take it to the market and we can do whatever. And he, he, he sat back in his chair and he said, why would I want, why would I buy it off you? Well, I can buy it from Belgium cheaper. F off out of my office now and I promise you, I promise you that was what the meeting was like. And I walked out of that guy's office and I felt about that tall because I thought, what a dick. So for me to do what I want to do, I've got to find meat partners who understand who want to collaborate. I've worked with many meat partners over the years vast majority have not understood what I wanted to do. I want to get close to the customer. I want them to allow me to do that. Because if that customer connects with my farm, yes, that customer is important, the service the meat guy delivers, it's important, everything he does. But I want that end user to have an emotional attachment with that farm, those animals, because that's not a day-by-day -day thing for these guys. So, you know, that was a stumbling block. You know, how many processes are going to allow you to do that? How many of them are comfortable with it? How many of them trust you? You know, what happens if I pick the phone up one day and say, it's 20% more for my pigs, or you've got nothing going through your factory tomorrow, and you're going to let down some serious people? So there's a huge amount of elements that need to take place. Collaboration, trust, flow of information, all of these things. But what I can say is, why would I, as a primary producer, as a farm, and that's what I love, that's what I'm good at, why would I want to build a processing plant? Why would I want to spend all that energy trying to understand that and do it well? I'm far better off to find a partner to do that. If we have a logistics problem with our Dingley Dell partnership, so if somebody comes along and says, I've got 200 restaurants all the way around the UK, can you service it? My business partner, has got a whole load of vans because we cover the whole of the UK. So what do we do? We go and seek someone who's got the experience, who's got the efficiency of doing it. Um, it's quite logical when you start to think about it, but it requires business collaboration. It requires enormous trust. Um, it's quite intangible how you look at it sometimes. I was talking to Andrew last night. My business, my business at farm level, we turn over four million pounds. It's not a huge amount of money we sell the carcasses to the processor, okay? He then pays me a royalty on the wholesale value of all of that, and when we develop new products, we charge royalties on it, so we set up some deals, so there's, there's a multitude of way of getting a bit of money, if you like, from the relationship. But as I was saying to Andrew, his 15 million pound turnover business, he wants to double, treble his business, he's a real dynamic character, um, He's a bigger business, I'm a smaller business. But we have an equal relationship. Why do we have an equal relationship? Because his business moves forward on the back of mine. We open the doors, he can sell stuff around it. Good luck to the guy. You know, we open a market in Arabian on the back of Dingley Del Paul. He then convinces them to buy beef or lamb or he decides he's gonna source something for them. That's his prerogative. So, so I'm very attuned to the fact that I have to deliver profit for the people I work alongside. I have to be incredibly important to them. If I'm important to them, why would they not look after me? It's a very simple, you know, when you drill down to it, it's a very simple scenario. Trouble is, you know, businesses don't work well together. We all, as farmers, we mistrust the processes, the packers. We don't understand the retailers. We just hate them. That's easy. Um, you know, it's how we operate. Some interesting uh, insights. Any of you have issues dealing with meat processors involved in that? Mm. So um, that's the situation, isn't it? Where you know traditional thinking about you know, no, we don't need a partner, we don't need to do this. Uh, but he developed that over a very long time and expanded it. So quite an interesting case study. Sorry, did you want to say something, John? Or you? No, you were just waving to me. Okay. Um, any thoughts on any of that to date about getting started? about that video, anything resonate with you? I think in our industry, um, the building of emotional relationships with our customers is really important. Um, it holds us accountable to our brands, but also they become our 
uh, ambassadors to the consumer as well. That's, that's so important in especially the beer part of the industry where I'm from. Right, excellent. Okay, any other thoughts? Okay. Well, some of the, um, I've just got a couple of slides here, I think pretty much to finish off where we are, before we get into general questions, if you wish. Um, keys for success. Just some questions again. See, I did say you, I need to ask a lot of questions or think about a lot of questions, so um, you're getting plenty. Um, keys for success, getting really clear about what we're trying to achieve, what's in it for us and what's in it for the others. As we've said, do we trust the others? I think in every one of those, uh, Marie, you know, Mark, they all talked about the level of trust, incredible levels of trust is needed, you know, to build that. Um, can we talk honestly with each other? What can we learn and do better? And are we free to make decisions with the other partners? So, are we, you know, can we actually sit at the table? Uh, have we got the freedom? I talk about this concept of creative freedom. If, you know, if, you're, if you send people to have discussions with other organisations or in a partnering discussion and you put them in a straitjacket, in other words, they go in and they're told they can't agree to this and can't do this and can't do that and report back and everything else, it's not going to go anywhere. You're not going to get the innovation. And especially if you have one organisation that's empowered, you know, a person sitting at the table uh, is fine. Is that me? Sorry. Um, so if people are sitting at the table um, and can make decisions and the person sitting across can't, it's going to get pretty frustrating pretty quickly. I've got to take it back. But then there are some situations where you have to build that in because you accept the fact that it might be a larger organisation and they have a corporate structure and they've got decision making processes, etc. to do it. And that's some of the frustrations of a small organisation working with a large organisation, for example. Um, have we got what we need from the various partners? Are the right people and organisations involved? Have we a plan? And does everyone in our organisation support the partnering? You know, have we got the buy-in? Have we got collective buy-in all the way through where we need it? It may not be the whole organisation if you're a very large organisation, but it may be the key parts that need to support it all the way through the chain. And that's it, basically. That's my little Partnering 101 spiel. For those of you who uh, want to know a little bit more about the partnering processes and how you might go about it, or perhaps reflect on some of the the partnering that you're doing at the moment or some of the relationships you have at the moment, where they are now, where you could take them, uh, what it might mean, uh, what investment are you prepared to make, but importantly, what value do you think you might get out of it? Um, and as I said a little while ago, I'm very supportive of partnering. I mean, that's my business to talk about this, but I'm not somebody that says partnering for partnering's sake. Um, and you've got to be very careful that partnering is a means to an end. It's there as one business model, one approach to getting an outcome. It is not the end thing in itself. Um, so only use it when you need to. Um, and if you're going to get into that space, learn about it, read it, read it up, and make sure your other partners or potential partners at the table understand some of the, the questions and things you need to consider or processes. And I can assure you, your path through that journey will be a lot smoother um, than if you just ad hoc move through it. So. Okay, so I'm not going to say any more at this stage apart from throwing it open now to Q&A, discussion, questions. This is an opportunity to sort of reflect or if you want to share anything. Uh, so let's just have a conversation, if you like, um, and think about it. So I'm going to actually sit down a little bit here. Um, okay, so any thoughts or anything you want to share? What do you think about this stuff? And we might just get um, Devin working around with the microphone, okay? Oh, sorry, you'd like me to come back? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, right, so it's your time. Questions, thoughts? This is an opportunity to get as much as you can. It seems that, that partnerships are something that historically have happened organically and, and through mutual benefit without being... I suppose created or, or or got on the front foot or contrived, yep. so to speak. I suppose when we get together this afternoon as an industry or as a region, uh, can you suggest any uh, particular direction we might want to take if we ultimately decide to uh, come up with a partnership between the breweries? 
or any specialised type of assistance because I think we're all a little bit time poor and it might be a bit difficult for us to actually bring enough resources together to create a, a genuine partnership. Um, I th what, I, what I would suggest is that you probably need to have that early conversation, you know, and just share those sort of concerns about, well, okay, if we do decide to come together, how would we do that? What resources have we got? What support might we need? You know, can DPIRD provide support or others provide support? Have you got local people here that can help you? You know, like, um, I think identifying the, the, the potential value proposition first and then saying, well, if we were going to actually try and achieve that, what would we actually need to have in place? Might help a little bit. I just caution a little bit about jumping too quickly down the track. Like if we decide to form a partnership, just take it. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Yep. Look, in, t in terms of resources, there's, um, I mean, this is a very quick overview course, you know. I mean, I've got this stuff in a 10 course, online course, you know, with like 200 pages of downloadable content, you know, so it goes into every stage in a lot more detail, you know, the creating stage, developing, etc. And this is kind of a foundation course, so there is more advanced stuff you can do as well, but that's getting down into the specifics of power, you know, letting go of control, you know, the more of the nuances and intricacies. Um, so you kind of got to decide if you're going to, you know, what you're going to do first, and there's support that can be offered. Um, yeah, you can get someone independently to help facilitate that and to, and to speed you through the process. Um, you can, um, and that's the sort of work that we do, you know, at times. Um, but also I think there's a lot, I mean, you might have local facilitators here or people that you can independently do. Um, I mean, I've gone through some overseas courses. I'm an accredited partnership broker internationally and a number of people, we've run the training program. I used to license it into Australia. So we've run it, there are hundreds of people around Australia. I don't actually know who's, if there's anyone in Western Australia, but I'll, I'll find that out uh, and someone we could link. Otherwise, I've got other resources interstate as well. Uh, one of my close associates is a business, had a very big business background in Telstra and other places. He's done major strategic alliances. So there is support out there, uh, but I'm sure you've probably got local clustering, you know, facilitators and support um, that you could hire locally, okay, and economically. Um, there is information out there, as I said, so there's other information if you want to research it and learn about it. Um, but look, I, I don't, I mean, can I just think, it's about actually having the conversation and it's about asking the questions, you know. I can't say, biggest success factor to me is asking the right question at the right time. And, and then, as I said, and that's why I wanted you to actually get and do that activity when I heard that you were meeting today. I thought I'll get you to actually, I don't usually do that, get you to think about what are the activities and questions at each stage. Um, because you've kind of got to internalise that, I think, um, in terms of what we need to do. I don't know if I've totally answered your question, but hopefully a little bit. Just, just look, exploratory. It's interesting, you know, um, I've, I've had this said to me by many not-for-profit organisations who are wanting to go and partner with large corporates, you know, and they kind of had this feeling that they actually need to go to the corporate with the full proposal, you know, the funding proposal, you know, here it is, you know, we present it and then the corporate will tickle. And I say, have you ever thought about just going and having an exploratory conversation? Just saying, actually, guys, we do this sort of stuff and you're in that area. How about if we actually have a conversation about how we might work together? You know, there may be some things that you're doing or thinking of doing that we could support. But there was this sort of mindset that because of funding, um, it was driving them down the, the path of, oh, we have to have a formal sponsorship submission basically um, to get into the corporate and what I'm actually trying to reverse that around um, is have the discussion. Can I just give you another quick example? When we started council amalgamations in South Australia way back there was a perception by councils that they had to agree to amalgamate and then they would work out how they're going to work together and do it. So it's like, and we had a couple of councils that actually passed a resolution and said yeah we've amalgamated but they had never had any discussions about what it is or how they're going to do it. And I was given this task and said, this is crazy. So we flicked the whole process around and said, no, 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 no. We don't want you to make a decision now. You make the decision right at the end, okay? And so we created this process where they, you know, first stage was facilitating, then they developed proposals, then they actually put it out to the community for a vote. So no one had to make a decision until the end. We had 34 
amalgamation proposals go through Executive Council in six weeks. Because we had 35 groups of councils working in parallel across the state and they all came in at the end. If we'd tried to force people to make decisions in the early stages, and the ministers wanted that, they kept telling me, Ian, go and tell them to amalgamate, you know? Nothing's happening. And I said, it will. <laughs> and it did. So hopefully that gives you another take on it. Just take it step by step and see where it goes. Um, is that, do you see that as one of the critical um, success factors was that you actually, the power was in taking everyone on the journey in the process Absolutely. rather than a dictatorship which quite often happens in some of the situations? We actually, I made it a point of saying we are here to manage the process. We will not tell you anything. I had so many council members come to me and say, oh yeah, just tell us where we have to put the depot. Just tell us who we should amalgamate. I said, you're the elected members. They stayed in the process. In Victoria, they got rid of all the elected members. We kept them in the process and made them actually work and think and come up with the decisions. Um, it was their responsibility. And we had people at the end of it that said, we don't agree with the outcome, but we can't fault the process. And that, to me, was the biggest success of the lot. Um, but anyway, without getting on, it's not about local government here, but I mean, in terms of the learnings, yeah, we created, uh, in fact, I told the guys yesterday, one of my success factors was to keep any stories on local government past page 13 of the paper. And I think there was only one time when we blew it, and got front page. But, you know, to me it was like, because it was, it was just happening. You know, it was a process people were working through. Sorry, yeah, Janelle. Do you think cultures interfere with partnering processes? Like, can it majorly affect the way that you do business? Um, you mean different cultures, different nationalities or different...? Well, I guess there's corporate cultures oh, um, in yeah. Australia versus overseas cultures in other countries. Um, and I'm just... I mean, I know that you can develop personal relationships with people, but sometimes I've just seen that cultural issues potentially mm. can be a, a block. Absolutely. And I think that's a key issue in terms of assessing alignment. Um, I mean, all of this, you have to go through this process of um, does it feel right for you? And I think in some of the others of the larger videos, they talk about their gut feeling. It still has to feel right. You've got to be able to sleep at night. You know, if you, in, and um, I always believe relationships work well when they, they're comfortable, you know, they, they feel comfortable. If there's tension, something's not right somewhere. Um, but certainly cultures need to be considered. But it's more, in fact, of the responses, how that um, reflects on... Exactly. Well, look, can I tell you, I've actually had situations when I was licensing the program out of the UK and even forming a collaboration in Canada, um, I thought English-speaking countries, they all thought like me. Little did I know. They had a different view of contract management understanding. Um, and in terms of dealing with my English colleagues, who I get on with extremely well, I was a bit um, direct probably with some of my emails and correspondence, so, which caused a number of reactions, which I had no idea about. So even you may think that we're all the same, but it's the way it's interpreted. And I think the other thing we haven't mentioned today is putting yourself in other people's shoes um, can be a challenge at times, but that's what you need to do. Um, Ian, I, I had a question um, related to a comment that you made. You, you asked, everyone's busy, right? Everyone's really busy working on their own business. Mm. If there is a decision made to form some sort of association or cluster or collective or partnership, whatever we call yeah. it, how important is it to actually have somebody as an external party, I've heard the term cluster manager, for example, yeah. to come in and actually then work and deliver for that organisation because, or the new association, because everyone is busy and then to take on another big role um, is a big ask for a lot of people. I know that you've got the former executive officer for the WA Brewers Association, I can imagine how difficult that must have been because you know you've got the corporate governance you've got events you've got a whole operational plan probably to deliver if you've got a strategy yeah. um, so that is how important is it and how should that be supported in your experience is that a role of government or is that a partnership with industry and government um, in your experience how would you see that play out it's actually interesting because I think um, in terms of the way I work as a partnership broker um, it's about coming in like situations like this, raising awareness, sharing information and knowledge, so helping to build capability and then withdrawing. In other words, building capability in the partners 
so there's no dependency on me, right? Uh, so it's actually working ourselves out of a job, and that's the true success. Um, there are many other situations you'll hear about where people will have coordinators or bring in resources. You just need to be very careful about that, that it doesn't become, yeah, we want a partnership, oh, we'll just get someone to manage it, you know? And it's kind of almost deferring off to them. Um, it has to be, I think, something, yes, someone may have to coordinate. When you get to that developing stage, you might need a resource that acts for all of the partners independently. Like in that native title process, that was our role as an organisation. We, I had a process, project manager, basically. We managed the whole process. But that was a statewide multi-million dollar initiative. Um, it's just, what I'd suggest is you work out all the stuff in creating. When you get to the stage of developing and you're like, how are we going to manage this? That's the conversation you need to have. But it's further down the track. Um, there are all sorts of combinations. I mean, many years ago, we worked on an initiative. In fact, that's when I was over in Western Australia running programs. Um, Ed Federal Education Department set up a program where they were trying to um, they appointed 107 partnership broker organisations, not-for-profits around the country, to try and get groups of businesses together with groups of um, schools to try and help transition of kids from school to work. Uh, massive initiative. So we ended up training hundreds of people around the country. Um, been to Albany, you know, down here at Mandurah, all over the place. Um, now, what they did was these organisations were the independent coordinators, so they went out and facilitated, we trained them, and then they helped organisations go through this process. So they picked this up, holus bolus. They went through the process and they ended up providing some coordination management support in many cases. Um, so it, it's, there's no fixed rule on it. Um, it's very much what's appropriate. And again, I'd suggest with all of this is what is appropriate to the partners in that situation. Uh, it could be government. It could be a combination. Um, Important too, I've seen many, Absolutely. working in government for quite many years in local and state, you've seen so many, in due respect to consultants, but they can come in, write yeah. something and then it just sits on a shelf. Yeah. So I think that notion of ownership is really important, whoever, Absolutely. and ideally the person who's going to deliver the strategy writes the strategy because yeah. they own it and then they're, they're, they're delivering on behalf of the stakeholders. Yeah, that's right. So I think the, the resourcing comes further down the track. When you've got something, when you've got a partnership up and it's operating and progressing down there, how, how do we keep it going? And it could be that the people that start it aren't the right people that manage it ongoing. You know, that you actually um, transition in some way. You know, so it could be senior people within an organisation start the partnership and then they have another group that's actually the operational management. You know? So those things need to be considered. One thing I didn't mention, you know that continuum, the sponsorship transaction integration? Many years ago I did some work for Austrade because Austrade, as you know, have lots of relationships all around the world. They had an initiative where they wanted to have fewer but stronger partnerships. They had these MOUs all over the world, everywhere. So they got me in and all, I went through exactly that, those same few slides and I got them to plot down where their relationships were and then they came up with their own labels for those different sections and they came up with networking, was the equivalent to sponsorship, and collaboration and partnering was on the right hand side. But interestingly, the thing I didn't stress earlier, once you define that, you can also define the business processes that sit underneath it and support it. So for networking, Austrade said, that'll just be information, it's fed back, no contractual information, we don't need to have MOUs or anything, it's just intelligence, basically. Collaboration, they said, no, that's where dollars is involved and it'll be underpinned by a contract. And partnering, well, that'll be managed centrally, it's probably aspirational, we've only got a few of our relationships that would ever even go there and that'll be a totally different way of operating and working because they recognise the difficulties being a government agency of even operating in that space. And they recognise that 98% of what they did was in the first networking or, or collaboration. Interestingly, Oz Minerals have ended up using pretty much the same framework. So they've actually, what I normally do is talk to organisations, do that, and then they come up with their language. So they own it um, and work out where their relationships sit. And you can do that in your own area. You can say, well, you know, what suits us? You know, and you can define all of your value chain or stakeholders and fit them into different bits and see where you go. Just a mapping exercise. So hopefully that's some help. So um, thanks everybody again and can we just thank Ian in the normal way? Thank you.